everybody to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum's Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson, and I'm the coordinator of volunteers, public outreach, and programming here at the museum. Thank you so much for joining us today for another program in our 2021 series, and welcome back to those of you who have joined us before. This virtual series features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics and stories about our collection that you can experience from home. So um, we plan to continue these programs regularly. If you have a program that you are interested in presenting, something related to um, the cities that our trolleys came from or the trolley era, Pennsylvania transit, please reach out and let me know. And you can find my email address in the confirmation email or the reminder email that you got tonight. It's assistant at patrolley.org. And you can see a full list of upcoming programs at our website, patrolley.org. And I will share that in the chat box in just a few minutes so you can click directly on it. And I wanna extend a special thank you to those who donated when registering for tonight's program and to those who have made donations through our website um, throughout the duration of this Trolleyology series. We truly appreciate your support um, of our virtual outreach programs. Now, I'd like to introduce the museum to some of you who may be new here. We were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. The museum opened to visitors a few years later in 1963 and is actually located along the line between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. You'll find almost 50 trolleys and electric railways car, about 20 of which operate. About 30,000 visitors per year take the four mile scenic ride at the museum. And we are now open Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays from 10 to four with the last trolley leaving at three through the end of May. And we will be returning to our full schedule in June, which means we'll be open Tuesdays through Sundays from June to August. This is a huge expansion from last year during the um, height of the pandemic. So we're excited. Our operators are ready to come back. So we're gonna restore our full Tuesday through Sunday schedule um, in June. And if you are a Pennsylvania Trolley Museum member, please check your email for a link to register for our virtual groundbreaking ceremony on Thursday. The groundbreaking is happening in person, although only invited guests um, are able to come because of the uh, mitigation efforts for the pandemic. So we are broadcasting it on Zoom. And if you're a Pennsylvania Trolley Museum member, you will have a link to that in your email um, as of, I believe, Monday. And if you're not a member, I encourage you to join. You can do that at our website, patrolley.org. And now I would like to introduce today's presenters, Matt Non and Harry Donahue. Matt is a licensed professional engineer who works full time in the transit industry. Matt has been involved with PCC car maintenance and restoration projects at several museums for many years. And he's a co-founder and director of the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, as well as a trustee of the National Capital Trolley Museum. Hi, Matt. <laughs> and Harry Donahue is joining Matt tonight. He's a retired professional educator and a former bus driver and dispatcher. Harry, excuse me, Harry has been involved with trolley museums for a number of years and led the restoration of former SEPTA PCC car 2168 at the Baltimore Streetcar Museum. Harry's also a co-founder and director of the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys. And uh, this program will be available on our YouTube within the next few days, next week or so. So um, this one you can watch again afterwards if you need to refer to anything. At the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with our presenters, but the chat box is open. So feel free to enter questions or answer them in the chat box. And we'll get through those at the end. Um, please keep your microphones muted and your videos turned off during the presentation so that our presenters um, can see everything on the slides and so that everybody else can see everything on the slides as well. I will invite everybody to turn on their videos at the end again during our discussion session. All right, Matt and Harry, take it away. All right, I will pull up the slides and if we just give them a moment to load and we'll be ready to go. All right, Kristen, I trust everybody can see the slides. I can see it on my end. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, good evening and welcome everyone. It's truly an honor for Harry and I to uh, participate tonight and be part of this great program that PTM has with the Trolleyology. Um, these are great programs 
you know, the interaction with others, you know, what you can learn from them. I really, we, we both really commend PTM for the job they're doing. And we're honored to share a little bit tonight with you about our experiences with PCC car restorations. Let me get the slides to advance here. We go. All right. So our program tonight covers a variety of topics. We've put them in group, you know, a little bit purpose and scope, why we're here, what we're talking about. <clears throat> we're going to talk about the background of the PCC car, but this has already been covered in a previous trolleyology and is known to many. We're going to talk a little bit about it in terms of what it means to today's restorer or maintainer. We have three groups of project profiles. And we're going to look at two case studies from Philadelphia cars, former car 2168 and 2743, two former Newark, New Jersey cars, six and 26, and then a truck overhaul project, an overhaul of a set of B2 trucks to a level that is appropriate for museum use. We're going to talk a little bit about maintenance and sustainment. You know, you've restored a car, what do you do with it? Some final recommendations, and then we'll wrap up tonight. So why are Harry and I doing this? We have been the beneficiaries of a lot of learning. Harry is a retired educator. I'm a part-time educator uh, besides my day job. We consider ourselves lifelong learners and we've learned a lot. We wanna help share that for the benefit of others. We think cooperation is how things get done, particularly with museums. And we'll talk some more about that. There are a lot of PCC cars still in existence from beautifully restored vehicles. You know, then we'll give a couple examples. There are some which are still in existence that quite frankly may be too far gone to restore. We'll help you know, give some guidance as to some ideas about the scope of a project and what you're really trying to do with goals. And there's a little bit of everything in between. As a generation of museum visitors and particularly volunteers has changed, the PCC car has grown in interest and popularity. Uh, things change. For example, we were, when Harry and I are at the Baltimore Streetcar Museum, there's several younger members, 21 and younger, who are active, very active with PCC car work. But keep in mind to Harry and I's generation, you know, to the youth, this is as old as what a conventional car would be to Harry and I. So, you know, the generations have changed. The interest in PCC cars among museum volunteers seems to have grown. Uh, I can think of a case where a museum one time said, we have a PCC and, you know, that's it. And also, Harry and I have learned a lot, but we certainly, and you'll never hear Harry and I say, we know everything, because we don't. And through interchanges like this and information exchanges, we can learn from others. We want to share what we've learned. But again, we don't know everything. Things like this are a great way to network, to learn from others. And we look forward to doing that. Yes, Matt, uh, you brought up about the popularity of PCC cars. Um, 30 years ago, when SEPTA was getting rid of all the PCCs in the city. Uh, I approached PTM about saving one 2723. And some of the older members at the time said, well, why do we need one? We already have a Pittsburgh car because they just were not that popular back then. But that has changed today. And a lot of museums really find that the public is interested in PCC cars. So let's talk about a little background on the PCC again. You know, this is relatively well known, and there has been a previous trolle trolleyology talking about the PCC car. Uh, but what does this mean if you're restoring one or looking at it through today's lens? Um, PCC cars are a technological leap from conventional trolley cars. You know, there are still many in the museum community who say these things are sophisticated. But go ahead, Harry, why don't you elaborate a little more on that? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, go ahead, Harry, please. Oh, OK. Um, now, I started to say before that uh, 30 years ago, many museums felt, well, they have one PCC car. What do we need another one for? Um, but um, they are more complicated than the older equipment, but they're also rugged. So when you can get a PCC out on a weekend, uh, in the case of Baltimore, we have cars that are 120, approaching 120 years old. And you put a PCC out, you don't have to get the ancient cars out every single weekend. 
you take the stress off these really older cars. Because even though they're 80 years old, the PCCs, they are pretty rugged. Exactly. And yes, at first glance, and unquestionably, they are more complicated than much of the older equipment. But it is a very logical design. Once you understand the design, how to assess them, and really how to do genuine troubleshooting, it makes a lot of sense once you understand them. There are a different set of tools you know, required in some cases. I'll talk about that a little bit towards the end. And different skills and techniques. You know, Restoring the car body on a PCC is a lot different than restoring a car body on a conventional car. And these were the last new technology for an industry that went into decline for a long time. What does that mean? That many cars lasted a long time. That's great. The challenge with that is though, and we're gonna give some ideas on that, You know, if you have the opportunity to select a car or which car you restore, um, you know, there's a lot of variables. Was the car overhauled and cared for? Was it run into the ground and then parked somewhere after it was you know, a condition not suitable for operation? That certainly will play into the scope and the plan for restoration. So you want to restore a PCC car. You know, one of the things we would stress is what is the goal? Now, goals can change, but what are you after? There's different levels of restoration. You know, is it a static display? Some cars, you know, because of funding, resources, where they run, you know, some cars may just be a static display. Is it a car that is a decent car, which we can give you some ideas on that, you know, where you could make some repairs and make it safe to operate? When you look at the four car profiles tonight, one of them we specifically picks, picked because it is not a complete, if you want to say tear down and restoration like one of the other projects we're going to show you. Um, so you've decided you want to, you, you've set your first goal, but have a plan, be flexible for changes. Now we're going to talk a lot about in the case of newer car 26 where the goal was to do the exterior, but it became apparent that doing the interior was the right thing. Sure, that meant a lot more scope, but we need to manage it. And how do you do things like that? Um, do your homework. And I say this because, and there's various topics here, you know, two things really come in, documentation and firsthand experience. You know, if you can get both, it's such a good thing. Um, all PCC cars are not the same. There is a, a lot of, you know, in some cases, misconception of that. There are very similar, you know, different models. But they are all not the same. You could have two cars, both with the same control package, a year apart, that are very different. Uh, having that documentation through troubleshooters, those that like to work on the mechanical electrical systems, having those drawings or schematics for your particular car, not any PCC. If you can get access to the company maintenance records or repair records, it's one thing, for example, Newark, New Jersey did really well. There was a record saved on every car other than the two that were sold to Cleveland. Um, you know, if you can get the specification package or the, uh, the parts catalog, these aren't just, you know, for replacing parts that you largely can't get, but they have diagrams of how things work and maintenance tips. Um, and really, more than anything else, it's a team. There, we're going to talk a lot about this. You're going to see a lot of slides in here that show the value of a team and how, the, how important that is and just how rewarding that is. So let's talk a little more about you want to restore a PCC car. This can be tough um, when you think about it. You know, is it a one of a kind? There are some PCC cars, of, you know, examples that are rarer than others. Is it feasible? You know, it, I, I will admit, Harry and I will both admit, we are realists. Not everything is feasible to restore. I guess anything can be done for an endless amount of time and money. But what is really feasible? And this can be a really hard decision. Uh, what do you have the resources to do? How far can you go with it? Uh, I'm going to invite Harry to talk a little more about the next bullet, pre-restoration storage and why that's so important. Go ahead, Harry. What was that, Matt? I didn't hear you. Oh, we're at storage. Before you start a restoration, why is that so important, Harry? Well, if the car has been stored outside for many years, uh, we found uh, it's a real problem. Uh, now, all of the existing Philadelphia cars, except for 2054 and Electric City, all the existing Philly cars had major, major overhauls in the 1980s. So mechanically, a lot of them were retired with very little mileage on them. 
even today, if you go under 2168 or 2743, the wiring is almost pristine because they didn't have a lot of use seven, eight years and they were all retired. Um, some of the car, the two newer cars we did, did not have those major overhauls. Uh, they did have some up, upgrading during the years. Um, but the two newer, the newer cars sat outside for a long, long time after they were retired. And we really learned some hard lessons, especially with 26. It had eight or nine coats of paint on it. And we found a multitude of sins. We had to get all the paint off it. And we found a lot of corrosion under the paint, mainly because it sat outside for 13 years before we got it down to Baltimore. And we'll share some of those, the photos which are coming, which is really the bulk of the presentation. We'll share some of what, what you find, that hidden damage, what you can find. As we mentioned, the design principles, okay, the, the fundamentals, let's say, within the design of a PCC may be common, but not all PCCs are the same. There are substantial differences. If you can get access to, in fact, one of the original TRC, Transit Research Council, spec packages and just compare some of the years and some of the changes, um, you know, again, information is key. The research to help make a better project. What compromises can you live with? There are going to be things that, you know, it's a, I'm going to say it's impossible to do everything. Uh, Harry and I are going to talk about two Philadelphia cars and some things we could do and just some things that were not feasible to do. Um, and then again, towards the end, we're going to talk long-term sustainment. So you've done this, you've worked on this car, you've restored it, improved it. You know, how do you keep it going? Something to be careful with, just you know, theories, uh, I say that because nothing beats, if you can have the expertise of someone who worked on the cars firsthand, uh, an individual who was managing the shop in Newark has been a great resource to us with the car 26, as well as car six before that. Uh, we were very lucky. We have, you know, a, we have a lot of friends who have worked for SEPT and retired or still work there. Uh, we were able to pick the brains of two people who some of the management said, these are the best guys if you want to talk to somebody about how to accept an accelerating relay. Right. But Matt, one of the things to point out, though, and that's why this is so important to share all this information. These guys that actually worked on these PCC cars are getting older and older and older. So they're not going to be around for the, for the indefinite future. So it's important to share all this information with the museums. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll put a little plug in that's something the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys have done is we have started and have been for a number of years now collecting PCC technical information, you know, not just Philadelphia, in fact, well, Friends Philadelphia Trolleys can only fund financially support Philadelphia cars. Um, Harry and I do work on other cars, not under FPT, but one of the things we've been trying to do is we collect technical data on PCC cars and then make it available to other museums. Uh, in fact, we just sent some last week, a, a memory stick to another museum of all the vintage PCC information we can get to try and help share the knowledge. Um, but that firsthand knowledge, if you can get it, um, be careful of it ran when it was parked. You know, it was a great car when it was parked 50 years ago and then lived in. Doesn't mean 50 years later, it's, it's going to be in good shape. Um, yeah, un it, unfortunately, there are some collectors out there that have 50 and 60, PCC cars rotting in the woods. Uh, most of those cars are beyond rehabilitation. Sadly, there are some one of a kind cars in these collections, but they're basically beyond restoration. 40 years out in the woods is just no good for an all steel PCC car. And it's important we mention, I, I know this goes without saying many of people on this group are experienced volunteers at museum or work in the industry or both safety always we're talking about old wiring there undoubtedly are toxic substances in these cars you know that well you know just that standard safety brief um worn equipment okay you know as we said some pccs were run to failure unfortunately you know safety first always because your visitors and your volunteers are not an expendable resource and it's important as museums we all know the importance of safety and why it's important to be safe not just for ourselves but for the good of this industry and also, I mean, it goes without saying, but uh, don't just put the pole up for a car that sat for a number of years and expect good things to happen. Uh, I think that goes without saying, but you know, 
contrary to popular belief, cars do not spring back to life on their own. Sort of like, you know, the, the old car theory. It ran 30 years ago. I could just put some fresh gas in and start it up. Not going to happen. So let's really get into the meat of it. Let's talk about our project profiles tonight. And we're going to start with two different Philadelphia cars. And we'll start first with car 2168. A little bit of background on this car. Uh, it was constructed in 1948 for the Philadelphia Transportation Company. As Harry said, the SEPTA cars, other than car 2054, they're surviving. They were all extensively rebuilt under SEPTA's general overhaul program. What did that mean? Entirely rewired. That is probably one of the best features about a former Philadelphia car. They have other challenges, which we're going to talk about. But the fact that the cars were completely rewired at one time as the cars were overhauled, there was extensive structural repairs. All of the control equipment was overhauled. Things like contactors were rebuilt, coils, traction motors. Granted, this was like in 1986 was not exactly yesterday. But, you know, compared to a car maybe which um, did not have this done, you can see the advantage. Car 2168 was still in running condition when it was retired in 2004. It went to the Baltimore Streetcar Museum in 2005, thanks to the sponsorship of the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, which uh, included a four-year restoration at $43,000. There is more work being put into this car, which we'll talk about towards the end. So, as, the, as was mentioned, the car was put up for sale in 2005 and purchased by the Baltimore Streetcar Museum through funds raised by the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys. It arrived in Baltimore. And you can see the car, okay, it was in running condition, but you can see some of the deterioration already. You know, some of that rust and rot, which we will show is not just surface. Right, it had sat outside from basically, even though it was available for charters, it sat outside from 1993 to 2005. Uh, and that's just not good. You can see the roof seams were starting to go and other problems. So the car went to Baltimore and what was the first goal? We talk a lot about goals and I think in retrospect is one of the best things we did. We set a goal, let's, obviously the car needs repaint it, it needs body work. We wanted to do something that no other Philadelphia city car, excluding red arrow cars, had done. And that was restored to the 1970s colors, which a lot of people call the Gulf oil, the white, blue, and orange. 2168 was the last car to run in these colors in Philadelphia. And we thought with the partnership with Baltimore, it represented something that no other museum had and an era that was not really represented among preserved Philadelphia cars. You know, the colors are striking. Some liked it. We did get a letter or two that said, I think that was the most awful thing ever put on a PCC. You don't have to deal with that. Um, but perhaps in retrospect, one of the biggest pluses of this has been that uh, Baltimore, especially with the trail, which now goes near the museum along the Jones Falls, gets a lot of walk-in ridership, uh, free COVID. And the colors are so striking that it actually draws people in to come and see it. It also has a huge fan following on social media and particularly among people who remember these cars in Philadelphia. Some people may remember the 1970s uh, when SEPTA uh, put out two cars, one in Gulf Oil and one in yellow. And they called the yellow one the banana car. Well, 2168 was that banana car. And uh, some people wanted to restore it as a banana car but that was short-lived. It was only in those colors for about eight or nine months. So one of the first things that was done, the car did go undercover. It was probably the best thing, you know, after that time. You know, and there, this is another lesson applicable. We were not ready at this point to even scope a restoration contract. We were not ready with the money. But what could we do? The first step was simply to get some primer on it, knock off the loose rust. This is not a fix. But what this did was stop any further deterioration. Then one of the other things we did, and we did this later with car 26, many years later, which I really think was a good thing. Harry and company, we mocked up the front of the car in the, what the finished colors would look like, um, just so people could get a sense. I mean, this is not, we did not use high quality paint at this point for the white, blue, and orange. What we wanted to do was give people, we had, we had settled on a goal, we were raising money, but you have to keep people interested. What, what's it gonna look like? 
So this gave them a preview. Um, many years before, Harry and I chartered this car on a trip. We called it the car of many colors. Well, uh, it certainly became that again. But you know, this helped. You could people could visualize at least a little of what the car would look like. This was the, actually the car's first trip in Baltimore, uh, which later uncovered a, a mechanical problem. But we'll talk about that. So. We looked at a lot of strategies and we realized that this is something that we need outside help for. You know, it's not a discredit to any museum and, or, and the volunteers involved, but there are certain things, in, in, and I think a lot of museums are finding this, that at times it may be just more advantageous, more expedient to bring in professionals. We were able to get in touch with two individuals who did antique auto restorations on the side. Uh, one was a professional welder, um, they both did this as a side job. They took an interest. They knew a uh, trustee at Baltimore and, you know, one thing led to another. And what we were able to do and how we really spearheaded this was raise money, contract these guys to, excuse me, to do a section at a time. You can see here, they start it towards the back on the door side. And then the car body was stripped bare everywhere we could get to. And Harry, do you yeah. want to discuss a little more here? Yeah, luckily it only had about two coats of paint on it because it had been stripped down pretty much in the 1986 restoration. So it only had the red, white, and blue on it and then the green and cream that SEPTA did. So it did not have a lot of coats of paint on it. Uh, but sitting outside for, for, let's see, from 93 to like 12 years, it did not do the car body any good. This, in fact, was one of the better areas. We'll show ones that weren't. Um, as I mentioned, the, the crew methodically worked an area at a time. You know, yeah, they started, it took, they started in, uh, I think it was early 08 and uh, took till late in 09 to get it finished. Uh, we had the internet by this time. We raised money, Friends of Philadelphia Trolley raised the money as we went along and, and gave the money to the museum. The museum just paid these guys. We didn't have all the money up front. We just uh, did it on a wing and a prayer, hoping the money would come in. And it did. Yeah, progress proved to be one of the best ways because people can get excited about it. We think that, you know, and we'll talk a little more about the advantages of social media for this. And Harry nor I are, are social media whizzes. I mean, I can do YouTube videos, but we have an individual that blows us both away with that. Thank goodness. But you know, we could show progress. We do newsletters, look what we're doing. Can you help us do more? And our crew was flexible to work with us on that. Um, this is a really critical repair. I'm gonna kick it off a little bit, let Harry talk more. That's that roof to body scene above in an all electric car above the sandy windows. Um, this area in particular needs to be properly repaired and treated. Harry, why don't you talk a little more about this? Yeah, well, the all electric cars roofs were different than the pre-war cars. Uh, they actually built the sides first and then lowered the roof section onto it and then welded, welded the, the interior of the roof to the crossbar, the cross beams. And I had always thought that they welded this seam. Well, they didn't. They left this seam flexible uh, so the car body would have some flexibility on rough track. So this was always filled, this we found out was filled with a sealant. Uh, and these guys had to repair. We found a lot of, uh, again, from sitting outside for 12 years, 13 years, a lot of problems up here. And these guys worked meticulously on this and we're still having some rust problems even to this day. We'll explain a little more, but the roof seam discovery is really interesting. Some of you may be aware, Harry and I were both really surprised with that. But sure enough, if you look up the one of the TRC post-war specs, it actually gives the spec for the sealant used. Uh, we've been using on the 26 project and our contractor use a Sika product. We, we spec'd out it's a commercial sealant that's extremely durable. Um, and, and as Harry mentioned, you know, it's simply a series of not tack welds, but small welds, and then it's filled with a seam seal. As we mentioned, you know, as the roof seam, they worked on the left rear, or excuse me, the right rear behind the rear doors first, and then worked their way along the roof. And I have some more photos of that. Uh, and as that roof seam was repaired, filled, 
sand it, and then finished. They primed it, as you can see here. Most of the work was done outside. Like we said, repair, prime, and repeat. Uh, people started calling it the ghost car after a while because it was great, but it was just methodical progress and it really yeah. helped us. It helped build enthusiasm. Go ahead, Eric. One thing we did on the interior, we took out all the ad card racks so that we could get at the roof seam from the inside and put rust converter, slap rust converter in there and then put uh, black Rust-Oleum paint and then put the ad card racks back in so that we tried to cover the rust problem from both inside and outside the car. And I couldn't agree more that we that is such a good preventive measure. Now, there are some areas in the 26, for example, that where new steel had to be cut in. But 2168, it, we didn't find it to the point it was rusted out. It was deteriorated. It had to be dealt with so it didn't become a problem. The rust converter and the industrial grade Rust-Oleum sealed it up you know, from the outside, put the card racks on, car doesn't sit out in the weather. Um, that's proven to give it long-term durability. So the car, eventually the bodywork was done. We were primed and we were ready to have our painters paint. It was 2008 at that point, and the little block number box on the front with the 08. Um, now notice, notice the standing windows are covered. The standing windows were plastic from the general overhaul in 1986. Probably Lexan, but by this time they were completely clouded over. So I got a price from a, a shop in Baltimore for standing windows. And we decided to do, uh, I think they were $20 a piece at the time. And there, what I think there are 28 of them. And uh, anyway, I said, let's, let's try this. So we put it on our, our website and everything. Who would like to donate a window? And first time we tried this. Well, it went so well that we actually got enough money to buy two complete sets of standing windows. Uh, even though we didn't know what we were going to use the extra set for, we bought them. And when we got to 2743, I was really glad we had that extra sets of windows. These windows from the 1986 overhaul, they're school bus style windows. They took the crank windows out uh, because they were in rough shape and put school bus windows in. Well, the school bus windows are welded. This, this part right here is original to the car and they welded these windows in. The, the thing is to replace them would have been an astronomical amount of money. So we let the school bus windows stay. Um, right. Yeah, there's a stainless steel sill, which is actually welded, carefully welded. Right here. Yeah, right here. The window. And, you know, Harry and I looked at this, as he said, astronomical is the best way to put it. We would have loved to get rid of them. A couple challenges. One, we did not have access to a complete set of split sash windows. The original windows were a split sash. These are these lower pastor windows where you see the bar. Um, we didn't have them. We would have had to have frames fabricated. Can be done, but as Harry mentioned, I want to say it's, and this is a ballpark, about 24 windows, all new frames. Um, yes, somebody said the crank mechanisms were left in these cars. Yes, they they're, the crank mechanisms are all in here. Right, but the tracks were not. Um, as, I, as we said, there were certain compromises we had to live with. If you look at when the cars were rebuilt by SEPTA, the sides were cut off. The interiors were stripped bare to a skeleton. It was the opportunity to do it. To undo that work was just simply not within the resources we had. It, our own ballpark figure would have been at least double, if not one and a half times what the rest of the car spent to do this. And it just, unfortunately, it just wasn't feasible. Um, you'll see when we go to the 2743, how we restored the interior, even with these windows to a vintage appearance and what we could do to try and you know, still make the interior as historically accurate as possible. And that's been throughout these. One of the things, you know, there are a lot of ways to do a PCC car. We have really strived, we talk a lot about the research, to do them as accurate as possible. There will be compromises, but we've tried to maintain that historical accuracy as much as we can because well, it is a museum, that's the purpose. 
So then it came time to painting and we used a, some of you uh, that have been involved with car restorations are aware of this product. If you're familiar with boat restorations, we used all grip paint. It's a marine grade paint, um, very durable product um, from every painter we've had use it. They really like it. Um, they say it is good to work with, but you have to stay within the parameters. Um, but you know, our painters loved it. They methodically work one color at a time. Um, it's expensive paint, but uh, the car was done in 2009. Other than an area we're gonna talk about, which was one lesson we learned, it is held up beautifully. Uh, we could just, to give, just to give you a ballpark, the total cost in 19, uh, 2009 for the all grip paint for this car was about 2,900 and change. Uh, the all grip for 26 uh, had gone up by this time to about 3,300 and change. So it, it didn't go up that much, but it's worth it. It's, it's an excellent, excellent paint. As Harry mentioned, the, the bio window program was fantastic. We found people, and understandably, I, we like to do this too, you know, donate to something tangible. We, we broke it into sections. You know, we're trying to restore this part of the car. You know, here's our current progress. But then the bio window really took off. And other than the lower passenger windows and the original, the, the front windshields were safety glass. So we left them alone. Uh, we weren't able to get a set of the original chromium plated windows. Uh, we tried. We weren't able. Although by this time, many of them were painted over. So we didn't lose that much. We were able to replace every other piece of glass in the car too. And Chaudron Glass in Baltimore, who does a lot of work for Baltimore Streetcar Museum, also provided all new rubber. Uh, that was one of the other most important things to prevent leaks. You saw a lot of leaks around the old rubber at the standing windows. Uh, the other thing we couldn't replace uh, in the 1980s overhaul, SEPTA replaced the windshields. Uh, the original chrome windshields were beyond restoration. And they put this um, thicker steel border around and mounted the windows in there. So it's not the original windshield. Uh, again, when we introduced the car to the public, uh, one guy kind of got me upset because he's first thing he said, well, why didn't you replace the windshields? And I said, well, you write us a check to get it done and we'll take care of it. But uh, uh, that's the only comment he could make. Well, why didn't you replace the windshields? But uh, again, that would involve heavy duty, uh, real heavy duty uh, work to get those. Plus we didn't have a set of replacements anyway. So, and then the interior. Now we're gonna talk about what we did on some of the other cars the interior. With 2168, we made a couple conscious choices here. One, the interior was in decent shape. And we weren't under the gun with time, but one of the goals from Baltimore was this car get done, this car enter service. It's an all weather rugged car. As Harry said, the point was 2168 runs, you know, something for example, like the, um, the, uh, the single truck open car 554 from roughly 1899 doesn't need to be carrying passengers. You could save those for special events. The interior was in good shape. Also, when it was in the Gulf Oil, the orange, white, and blue colors, this car had fake wood paneling applied below the passenger windows. You know, some of you may remember uh, living rooms in the 70s and things done that way. Uh, we did not want to put that back. We thought it looked awful. Um, so we elected to keep the 1980s interior colors, but we repainted everything. The seats were in really good shape. Over time, they've started to deteriorate with age and methodically we have replaced, I think we're on track to have them all done soon. You know, as each one went, we cleaned all the light fixtures. We actually had to do some repairs to some of the interior lights. Um, you know, some bad sockets, we took care of that. We cleaned up the interior, but we did try to add some period touches. We got an original type fair or original to that vintage, except the fair box, which then Mike Lawson, Mike's a man of many talents. We're gonna talk about him a little bit in some of the other projects. Uh, restored the box, tore it apart, and completely restored it. Um, we've tried to put ads in it from, with some exceptions from the 70s and 80s in Philadelphia to try and um, you know, keep its appearance. But we made a conscious choice not to go backdate it. We did not want to do the fake wood paneling. Um, not every car had it. This car did. Uh, we also didn't have a source for the cranks in the original windows. 
Yeah, actually, to be historically accurate for a Gulf oil car, this interior should have been a, a an awful look. It looked like they mit, mixed uh, orange and some peachy color together. It was like peachy or it was awful. <laughs> it was it was a really awful looking color uh, when it was Gulf oil. So we decided the. 1986 uh, interior with the blue was much more appropriate to leave in. So we left it the way we just updated it. We just restored it in the blue color. Now, some may ask, Baltimore, if you're familiar, Baltimore's track gauge is five feet, two and a half inches. Philadelphia is nominally five foot, two and a quarter, two and a half. So what do you do with the difference? Baltimore shop made these spacers, and I'll show you what they look like. We nicknamed them donuts, okay? And they sit on the back cheek plate of a super resilient type of wheel. And then the wheel sandwiches, the rubber inserts as they're called, goes on top. The wheel portion goes on the other sandwiches. And then the, um, you have the top cheek plate, the, some call it the hub plate. Um, they also had to make these new spacer bolts. But with that, an equivalent size one on each side, the car could be regaged to run on Baltimore's track. And again, their shop made all this in-house that made operation of the car feasible. So then one of the things tonight, I'm not gonna go into excruciating detail with the electrical and mechanical repairs. This is a broad audience. Some of you are really into that, like I am. For those that aren't, I don't wanna go too far. This is supposed to be a general presentation. But I'll highlight a couple things. Um, so 2168 was a running car. But if you look over my good friend Matthew Mummert's head, Matthew also works in the transit industry, you'll notice something. You'll see something burned. If you look closely, I've circled it. That is the M end of the commutator controller, the motor controller in a general electric car, commonly called the KM. Uh, we found that a number of the elements, resistor elements in it, had burned together, had fused together. Over time, that also burned a hole in the commutator, meaning the KM was, the car would run, but we couldn't leave it this way. There was no question the car would not perform cor correctly, and it didn't, as we joked, but it was a running car. Um, thanks to the foresight of the late Bob Hughes, he got Baltimore a spare KM unit that had been damaged. So what we did was we ended up taking pieces of one and pieces of another and making a complete KM. But thankfully, the one that was damaged, the, uh, the, where the pilot motor goes on the left side, uh, was bent. But we could take that off. The rest of the unit was in good shape, drop the other one, and then it was a dreadfully hot time of year. Uh, you can see Bill Monahan and I you know, and others reassembled this. This was an interesting thing. Um, I'm not here to give you the merits and pros and cons of GE versus Westinghouse. Okay, there, there are some who swear by the Westinghouse control system. I learned a lot from a, set, from a retired mechanic who spent a lot of years and he preferred, he thought a GE all electric was the best car ever built. And if to people from Pittsburgh, you may think that's odd. Um, again, there are pros and cons. You can debate, there's pros of each, cons of each, you can debate that all day. One thing though about the, the GE, Commutator controller, which was a misconception, is it's very hard to remove. It's not, if you follow the instructions. It's actually designed that certain parts will swing out of your way. The entire assembly will drop down. Uh, we were lucky Baltimore shop made a special cradle for it that fit on their pit jack. Uh, it, it was not bad to take it out. In fact, in one of the GE tech manuals, it actually tells you how to take one of these things out, which takes some of the mystery out of it. Um, but we're able to take two units, make one. Over time, things wear out. The original motor generator lasted a long time, but it eventually died. Thanks to the generosity of Bill Wall, many of you know him, we got a loaner unit while we were able to have another unit overhauled completely. Um, as we mentioned, 2168, when Baltimore's open runs, probably the most of any car. Now, the car is completed in 2009. It's been part of Baltimore's operation ever since. It's the Christmas car. It's got various other, it's, it has a great fan following. One of the things we learned in this project, and you know, Harry and I aren't ashamed to say, we don't know everything that we learned. Um, we got some advice at that time that said that lower, we call it the rub rail. The rub rail right here. This is the lower, the, the orange is the lower car body. There's a rail which sits off the car and then the blue is the skirting. You can see some rust. 
we were given advice that if you take the rub rail off, it's almost impossible to put back on. That was not the case. So our body crew did what they could to get behind it. But the back end of it, the far left of the picture, this sits flush with the car by design. And what it does is it collects moisture. So over time, it started to rust here again. There is a good news in this. One, we're going to talk about how we applied this less in other projects. But two, since that time, the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys has raised money. We have a contractor lined up who we trust. They've done some other work for us to come in. We've raised approximately $15,000 to have this cut out and the lower sections of the car replaced. The rail will come off. This will get treated properly around the perimeter of the floor line and we won't ever hopefully have to do it again. We also have raised money to be a match. We have a grant application to replace the passenger doors in the car. They date from, if not the 1980s before, uh, we have a master carpenter who's built doors for PCCs. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but, you know, this was a lesson. Thankfully, it has a good ending. We were able to do this. You know, we now have the foresight to consider this for future projects. And we like to think we made a positive difference. Uh, in 1998, the summer, Harry and I, for a private group, we donated all the music, all the proceeds to a museum, chartered car 2168 for its 50th birthday. Uh, 20 years later, we staged the car in 2018 for then photo. Um, thankfully, both the antique car and the 2168 are still with us and both look a lot better. And again, one of the things that helped is having good sponsorship. Friends of All of Trolleys was able to sponsor this. Undoubtedly, this has been one of the most popular projects the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys have ever attempted to support and fund. And that statement continues with the work, uh, the, the upcoming work. So we learned a lot with 2168. We said, let's do it again. Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys are not a one museum entity. You know, we support, we accept requests and evaluate requests for from different museums for Philadelphia cars. So the opportunity came up to do something with car 2743. A little background on this car. It was constructed a year earlier than car 2168 for the Philadelphia Transportation Company. Uh, even though the number is higher, that denoted a two-band car. Just because it has a higher number doesn't mean it's newer. Uh, this was also rebuilt. This was a few years earlier in 1984 as part of SEPTA's general overhaul program. It was retired in 1993. Thankfully, it didn't spend a lot, out a lot of time outside. Rock Hill Trolley Museum acquired it in 1994. They were able, using some Cleveland PCC truck parts to regage the car uh, by swapping the axles and doing some other work on it um, in 1998. But by 2004, it was out of service with some problems, not the least of which was a blown traction motor. We later found there were two of them that were bad. Um, in 2009, thanks to some initial grants, the car was returned to operation. And in 2017, after $50,000 of contributions over time from the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, the restoration was, for all practical purposes, completed. Yeah, a big plus for this car. It only sat outside for barely a year before it went to Rock Hill. Once it was at Rock Hill, it did not sit outside. And that was a big plus when it came to restoring the car. But as we mentioned, where did the work start? Underneath. There were two bad traction motors. Um, ironically, if two motors were pulled and it became obvious that the others, some of the others, even though they were running, were so deteriorated, uh, ended up all four motors were overhauled. Uh, in fact, one, the armature had to be rewound. If you're familiar with that, uh, it's a rather extensive process. This gave the opportunity to get under the car and really clean it and preserve it. Um, these cars were overhauled. They didn't have a lot of years of service after they were overhauled, but Philadelphia salt covered streets. Uh, the bulk of this work was done. We mechanically, the photo on the right, cleaned off anything loose, used industrial primer. We used an industrial gray so we could see things under the car that proved to be a good decision. Uh, there was some area of the cooling duct for the motor generator. Uh, no joke, we found a two by four piece of wood jammed in it. We took that out. We actually made a new piece, riveted it on and sealed it. Um, but while the, the, the car was detrucked, it really gave us this opportunity to get under the car and hopefully do some preventative work. So in 2009, uh, the car returned to operation. It was far from pretty, it was far from complete, but it ran, which was a milestone. So then we said, let's set another goal. Let's restore it to vintage appearance. Now, 
through a series of decisions and compromises, and I'll let Harry talk about why we chose this as opposed to the earlier with the silver roof, we decided to restore car 2743 to how it looked from about 1959 to 1968. The, the appearance you see in this photo on the right. Um, Harry, you want to talk a little bit about that decision? Yeah, this photo is from John Engelman. He took it when he was operating uh, the car in 1967. We decided to go with the solid cream roof. Uh, the cars came with a silver roof in 1947. But with the first paint job, when the cars were three or, three or four years old, uh, they had not only the silver roof, but they had pinstriping along here. Uh, when you have 210 of these cars, they decided this is too much trouble. We're doing them all the solid roof. Some people in Philly call them bald eagle, uh, bald eagle paint job. But this is how this is how they ran for most of their career in Philly with the solid cream. Uh, so we decided to go with that because that was that was how most people remembered them. So we set that goal and then one of the things we did was we set up again. We, we solicited from contractors. We actually accepted bids from different contractors. We reached out to firms that we knew of or were recommended to us from past work, um, whether it be on a PCC car or other. Uh, we actually wrote a contract package. I know not everybody's here to learn the business side of things. and We're not the experts in it. But we had some background with contracting, uh, myself in particular. So we, we wrote up a spec package. We wrote up a statement of work and then what we called a supplement, which was photos to further illustrate what we wanted done. We put together a team of people who would go inspect the car with any project like this at a contractor facility. You really want to have people go periodically and check on the work, not just to check up on your contractor, but also to answer questions. You know, the decisions that are left to sit don't help the contractor, don't help you. Um, so we looked at various options. We decided to go with an outside contractor, uh, even with the trucking costs, we got an acceptable price. And the work was 230 miles away over in Booton, New Jersey, by a firm called Star Trek, which still does work for, uh, you know, particularly private car restorations and other work. Um, but Harry, thankfully, you know, used to live in that area and by and large, some of the rest of us went up and participated, but uh, handled the inspections. And work began pretty much once the car arrived. Um, the car was stripped down. You know, it, we found that it, during the general overhaul, the car was painted, but there were a couple coats of uh, the red, white, and blue. They were able to sand it down such that anything loose was gone. You could see some bare steel. Um, and then methodically worked their way around to treat the rust. When you strip a car down, you find a lot of hidden rust. Now, this was a lesson. Spot. Go ahead, Harry. No, it's the this? usual spot for a PCC, but this time they they said we're taking that belt rail off that that all the way around. We will get it back on, and they did. Here's before, here's after, and, and they also built it out a little bit from the car body where it curves here, so that water goes through. Uh, Original as originally built, this was pretty snug up against the car body. But uh, they, what would you say, about half an inch, Matt? Yeah, I think like half to three eighths. It's not yeah. much, but enough that water can get enough through. that the water does not sit here on the rub rail and just goes through and runs out. And uh, but they got they took the entire rub rail off all the way around. That was the mistake we made with the first restoration. And we'll let, as Harry said, we'll let the little secret out. That's not original because we had a they had, we had them made a stand that was the same size of the stands. We have a better picture later in a different car for the rub rail. So again, that I don't call it a design flaw. I don't know that they intended the cars uh, to last 80 years. No, I, what was it? 20, 25 year life? It was probably, yeah. I don't know that there was a fixed service life, but it was probably envisioned. You know, if you look at comparable cars from that era when things were retired, um, you know, so it was, hopefully this will help avoid this problem in the future, but you know, we did make that design change. And then this was another area you really couldn't get to, but the back corner here in several cars, you'll see another example was a lot worse, um, where the rear of the car body, both here and then I don't have a shot, but on the lower body, you know, much of the steel had to be cut out, replaced. Uh, they methodically went through this. Now, the 
PCC, some people, you know, really pay attention to the details. They know the doors. The doors as originally built had rounded corners. Uh, after PTC, starting in the late 50s, replaced the doors with wood. They went to square corners. We actually matched that. Uh, this was an interesting lesson learned. It was a good one. I don't think there was anything necessarily wrong with it. We called for new doors. The uh, contractor had a new set of PCC doors, new old stock. They had never been installed. They were wood. Um, I said they looked like new. We inspected them. They said, we'll modify the windows and go with it. We went with it. Uh, you know, if we want it new, you know, if you want to say stick built doors, doors built up from raw material, we didn't specify that, but they had new old stock doors. We were able to look at them. I forget even where they got them from, but they were PCC wood doors. We looked at them, inspected them. They modified the windows. We were thrilled. And these also got all safety glass. And any of the cars we've done since this, if we've replaced the glass, we put safety glass in. So, and this was the first, if you want to say, and give some others, we really got into the details on this car. Uh, and we think it paid off. Now, this was... Here. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Harry. Why don't you explain Remember the... Remember what we said, we talked about, you got to strip them down. Um, <laughs> when we got to the roof, this is the rear, looking towards the rear of the car, they stripped the rubber mat off and this is what we found if we hadn't stripped that off we would have never found it during the general overhaul this car was overhauled in 1984 evidently i mean septa really did a good job with most of these cars but what we found they did here i guess they said oh well these cars are only going to be out on the street for eight more years there was a big hole a leak in the roof right here so rather than cut it out and put a new piece of steel in, they found a matching piece of a roof from a scrapped all electric <laughs> and just pop riveted into the roof and then covered it with the rubber. And because of all this water getting in, it ran down the sides and the back and caused all that corrosion. So again, we, we're glad we had, we had them strip the car completely. Because the rubber matting on the roof, again, the car only ran about six or seven years after its overhaul before it went to Rock Hill. But if we hadn't stripped off that rubber matting, we would have never found this. So this, of course, added to the cost of the car. It was, they had to completely rebuild and put all new steel in that roof. If we hadn't stripped it down, we would have sent it back to Rock Hill with a terrible roof back here. Yeah, I'll never forget the contractor called and said, I, you're not going to believe this. There's two roofs on the back of the car. And I said, yeah. what? And Harry went up and looked. And the yeah. one section is over top of the other. And they cut it out. Go ahead, Harry. Somewhere I have, they propped it up against the wall, this old roof with the rivet holes in it. Somewhere I have a picture of it, but I can't find it. I took a picture of it. The one thing, Star Trek was really good people to work with. They did a good Very job. Good. Very good to work with. You know, the, the contract modification, we negotiated, you know, it, it was a very fair price. They cut it off. You can see the new one in, uh, they're just, they welded it, they're finishing it there. Um, but again, you know, it was not in the contract, it was unforeseen. We negotiated a reasonable price, got good quality work from it. Uh, as we mentioned, we really, they did a professional quality job. If you've been to Booton, you may have seen the GG1. You may have seen their former New York Central Observation car, the Hickory Falls. Uh, beautiful job. You know, they invited us up anytime to inspect any of their other cars and see what they did. Uh, you know, we got a very reasonable price for it. So yeah, here we're close. I would not hesitate to recommend uh, Star Trek. If anybody has a PCC they, they need to send out, I, I, I would not ha hesitate to recommend them. Yeah, in fact, and they became somewhat of a savior for us in this sense. We did ask the team that did 2168 and had so much other work in their day jobs. They said, you know, we didn't lose money. We loved it. We just can't spare the time to do it. We would have brought them back. But Star Trek proved to be a very, you know, a good contractor. You can see here it's getting closer. Uh, this car was painted with deft paint. You know, it's an aerospace paint. Um, they loved working with this. The deft paint, one of the things they said is because it's for airplanes, uh, a lot of transit vehicles use it too, uh, transit buses. They said it could be, uh, you could spray this at temperatures much lower than the all grip. Uh, we've not seen any difference in durability either. 
Now, as I mentioned, we started to get into the details. One of the things we wanted was the correct style golden glow headlight. And we were able through, a, uh, through the folks at San Francisco MTA to get the model of replica golden glow headlight they used. It's actually, Harry, go ahead. What do you want yeah, to I, I contacted Carl Johnson, who was then at Muni, and uh, asked him where they got the uh, replica style headlights. And it was from, uh, it's, a, it's a company in Nebraska uh, that supplies, it's for classic auto restoration. And I, I, I can't think of the name right now, but uh, you have to buy them in pairs because believe it or not, they're for a 1932 Ford Coupe. But instead of having the old style, weaker light bulb inside of it, it has modern, a much more powerful light inside of it, but it pretty well replicates the original style of the Golden Glow headlight with mo with modern lighting inside of it. But uh, yeah, it, it comes from a classic auto restoration place uh, in Nebraska. And it still has, as Harry mentioned, has a new bulb. You can get both the high and the low beam, but it still has the, the proper reflector. I mean, it is the right style Golden Glow headlight. It's modern. You see the wings too. We're gonna show you some other details uh, the Friends Philadelphia trolleys had everything, if you want to say re -chrome. the wings, the marker light bezels or doors, the tail light bezels or doors, we'll talk about that. Um, you know, maybe we went a little overboard, but we wanted the details to be right on this car. Um, people make the difference. We're going to talk about that some more as we go on, but you know, having a good team, Harry methodically every few weeks was up to inspect, to talk, to give ideas. You know, I was on the phone. Harry did a lot of the, the on-site. I did a lot of the contract management. We worked well as a team. Uh, other guys went up and helped Harry. It worked well. On the right is the Star Trek crew. Second from right is Ray Klaus. Raymond Klaus, he is the proprietor. Good, talented guys. Great to work with. Uh, we were pleased with the finished product. So the contract was completed. You'll see the car is not done. There are not decals on it. There are some other things which were not in the contract. Uh, but the car came back to Pennsylvania. Oddly enough, uh, it was the first time since it was delivered that we knew the car ever left Pennsylvania. And that was a fun day, June 27th of 2015. We had a blow dust and the other debris that comes, you know, from a from a rebuilding a car out of the controls, inspect everything, put the lightning arrestor back on it. And then we gave Harry the privilege of doing the first test run. You see there's Harry, Bill Monahan, and myself on that first trip we worked on that day. The newspaper actually showed up to see what was going on. And then we said, let's get the exterior car body details done. So we're gonna walk through some of the details. Uh, we got a correct period, 1960s to 1970s roll sign that was donated. Um, you can use child labor, provide it they're related to you. Uh, but we had a lot of youth get interested in this car. You can see they're cleaning the destination sign. We were able to get that. We had another individual replicate the number sign of the correct font. We got a vintage block number box donated. That was restored. Again, another youth project. Um, again, we were like, what can we get to get the details right as much as we can? And it became a lot of fun. It was a lot of research too, but a lot of fun. Somebody donated these cars because they were built as two-man cars. They had a sign at the front that flipped over, pay enter, pay leave. One was donated. The photo on the left shows before and after. We we're actually able to salvage this with some work with some rubbing and polishing compound. Uh, we made a custom frame for it. The marker lights. We had the doors or bezels or frames, you want to call it, re-chromed. We got correct glass for the rear. Now, prior to the 1970s, this class of car in Philadelphia had blue marker lights in the front. We said, we got to do this. We actually found a vintage truck supplier that made these, they were plastic. They had a small hole in the top for screw. We were able to get, find some blue clear filler to blend it in. We made our own gasket so they stayed weather tight. But we said, there's just one more detail. We really want to try and get this historically accurate as possible. You know, again, teamwork. I can sense. jump, Matt, if I could just jump in there. If, sure. if anyone needs re-chroming done, like we got the wings and the marker-like holders done, LeBrandy, LeBrandy, uh, again, mainly an antique auto group. Uh, they do beautiful work. 
there in Middletown, Pennsylvania. Excellent work and good to work with. That's important. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, they do a lot of work for the cars at the, the former AA Skate Museum in Hershey. Um, yes. They're not cheap, but the quality, we, we were just thrilled. Um, teamwork. Teamwork makes it happen. So we had decals made. Actually, Bruce Wells had these made for us, Bruce from PTM, uh, to a, the style. We, we examined the the 2733, the car in Septa's headquarters in the basement. Uh, Dr. Mark, as he's known, Mark Dawson came up from Baltimore. We asked him. He came up and did some of the decals. Steve Gehring, many of you know through his antique bus. Uh, he came up and did some. And it was gracious. Mark gave up a day and said, hey, this is just fun. He came up and helped us. So here was the car, as we said, we got into the details. Uh, you can see the blue marker lights, the real glass in the destination sign, the correct vintage signs and fonts the block number box, the pay enter sign, the headlight, uh, the tail lights. We even went one step further. We got um, the correct style, as they called cat's eyes with the stop in them, except they'd replace them with plastic in the GOH, just a regular light. Um, they're I, I, actually, I had, thanks to the late Bob Hughes, when we were overhauling 2168, I contacted Bob. He still was, he had retired from SEPTA. And I told him we were looking for these cat's eyes. Well, he put me in place with a place uh, up in Connecticut that I had originally manufactured these things. And just by chance, they looked in their warehouse and they said, well, we got two sets. So I said, I'll take both of them. <laughs> uh, this was before we even knew we were going to restore this car. Just a stroke of luck. I got the last two they had still in original packages from the 50s. It was great. And Buster Hughes of Baltimore, you know, made us, he had some old Baltimore ones, Harry, and recrammed the frames or the doors for them. Uh, they are amber. Some PCC cars had red. These were actually amber. We even went one step further. It was a youth project. Two youth uh, were mentored and we rewired the taillights so that they, as built, work only off the brake. Um, later, they were changed to a dual filament, you know, so you always had the lights on except when, you know, when the brakes came on, the second filament came on, we rewired them so that they actually work off the brake pedal as original. So we met our second goal. Rock Hill had a heck of a celebration in 2015. They completed three car restorations that year. Uh, we even had Steve Gehring dress up like he was a St. Louis car company salesman. We had a lot of fun with this. Uh, and that's important. You work on these projects, you have a good team. You gotta take some time to enjoy. Um, we didn't rejoice too long. Why? Because Harry said, look, this looks so good. How close can we get the interior now to the right vintage? So, you know, this gives you a good example. This was the St. Louis Car Company builder's photo. The only difference for somebody really with sharp eyes, we'll see the conductor's booth on the right. We didn't do that. That's not of the image and the era that we did for the car. But we started to transform, whoops, I jumped ahead, I'm sorry. We started to transform this car inside back to the PTC era, the late PTC This era. was after a return from Star, Star Trek. And yeah. if you remember, remember I talked about the donate a window from 2168. Well, we had enough windows to completely install in 2743. But the big problem with the interior was the seats. How are we ever going to pay for new seats, they have to be brown. So we said, hey, people like to donate for a window. Let's give this a shot. Uh, I got a price from an upholsterer near me who had repaired a couple of 2168 seats. He gave me a price for the double seats, the single seats, and the big bench seat in the back. I think I think that the doubles were 245. And the singles were 195 or 200. I forget. Anyway, we started on the internet and on our website. Who would like to donate a seat? And believe it or not, within 13 months, we had every seat paid for. Uh, just kept it out there on the website, our newsletters. Uh, we we didn't have social media let, yet, like we did on 26, but. I think the total price was $7,450. And we raised it in 13 months just by who would like to donate a seat. And it worked out beautifully. As the money came in, I would take two or three seats out, bring them back, 
down to the upholstery place near me. And as they got done, bring them back. So we did them two, three, four at a time as the money came in. Rather than wait till we had all the money, we just we just took a chance and say, okay, as the money's coming in, we'll get them done. It worked out well. We're going to walk through that in here. Um, you can see, but they start at the back and it wasn't just paint over everything. It was stripped down. There's a lot of loose paint, peeling paint. You had to prep the old paint. And Harry had gotten a match for the interior colors. And Harry and a team of volunteers, a really diverse team of volunteers to talk about, got into this. And we just worked front, front to back. Uh, you can see John Stossel. He was a local, uh, you know, somewhat local to Rock Hill. Really loved the 2743. Bonded well with the team. He jumped right in. Um, and we just, as Harry said, just methodical process. You saw the lights coming down. Every one of those was cleaned. We had a couple of bad sockets. And it seems to be a common theme with PCCs. We fixed yeah. that. Bob Hughes told me years when we were doing 2168, he said, take the globes home and run them through your dishwasher. And that's what I did. <laughs> and they cleaned up beautifully. They cleaned up beautifully. I give Harry credit. He had a load of PCC light fixtures, minus the guts, of course, just the globes. <laughs> but it worked out really well. And one thing was, okay, we're having the seats done, but we have to sand and strip and prep the painted parts of the frames. Uh, and the seats had to come out, you know, to get to behind where the seats were. As Harry said, the buy a seat campaign was great. I mean, it worked out well. The seats came out. Uh, you know, Harry had the, the two shades of green match. We had a team come in and just methodically, weekend after weekend, you know. just Now, one out. of the things, one of the things here, Below the windows, the old armrests were gone in the 1980s overhaul. And SEPTA replaced it with a, a patterned stainless steel that had a pattern in it. And I don't know what you would call it. But anyway, the key was getting a really good primer before you put the green paint on. We primed everything. That made a huge difference. We would have loved to have the armrests. In fact, we had somebody say, you know, I got one or two. We couldn't get the whole car. We said, okay. How close can we get? We're gonna to have to make that compromise. You can see the wind is here. You can see the stainless steel sills. You yeah, know, that was that was the 1980s rebuild. We've talked about if we ever got a set of cranks for the crank windows would put them as dummies possibly, but we did everything else we could to make it historically accurate. The sliding back window was a something we added. Rock Hill has no loops or wise. The car has to be backed up. Uh, also, some of you probably noted the front pole, just an operational necessity. Uh, let's say we had a really fun group of people that got into it, worked well. You can see Rob on the left and a significant other, Shao, who came up, worked with us. They were a lot of fun. They're from the Philly area. Um, Alex Campbell on the right, who on the, uh, or excuse me, on the left, on the right was uh, James Kelleher. He was a local college student who ran into Harry, thought, got talking, and said, hey, I want to work on this. And he'd come down from Juniata College and jump in. He's since left the area, but he had a lot of fun with it. Um, you know, the team was great. It, it, we had a system down and, you know, it worked really well. As Harry said, we're getting, you know, we had the seats done. He was able to match the type of upholstery. Um, Logan Tracy on the left came up repeatedly from Baltimore. Mike Lawson on the right. Uh, Mike's just a joy to work with. One, he is a blast. He's a lot of fun. Uh, you probably have seen his name. He works a lot at Baltimore. He helps at National Capital sometimes. He's helped a lot on the, the CA and E car at Rock Hill. Uh, he's been a regular on the 26 project. Just he got into it. Mike brings a lot of talents. Just he likes PCC cars. He had a blast. Mike also has spent many years as a hobby restoring antique autos, which helps a lot. Mike, uh, uh, back, back up one. Sure, please. This is Logan Tracy, who we'll see when we get to car 26. Uh, thanks to his social media skills brought us a lot of money. Right now, we, we weren't doing social media, but I wanted to point out Logan because he becomes an important part of this. And also we talked, we got in the exterior details. We got in the interior. We put a plea out. Does anybody have the original style thermostats? Our friends at Northern Ohio Railway Museum said, hey, we got a box of these, can you use them? Now, the cars in there rebuilt at a different thermostat, but we wanted these. Mike Lawson took them home as Mike does and restored them. Uh, we even got the correct wing decals for the timetable holders. Someone else found these, gave it to us. That is correct for the car. Um, we even have, it's not in this photo, a rate of fare card from the 1960s that we reprint it and laminate it. We even went out and 
found the correct font style for the lettering for the front and the exit doors, the builder's plate. Um, you know, we, we really had a lot of fun trying to make it again as accurate as we could. Yeah, Bruce Wells did all the all the work on the decals. Bruce Wells did all this at PTM. And they turned out beautiful. And they're the right style for that vintage in Philadelphia. Yeah. You can see here we're getting closer to the end. We had it, we got a vintage operator seat donated, which we had reupholstered. Um again, Mike with the fare box. It's actually somebody may point out it's a red arrow fare box. It's close to what they had in Philadelphia at that time. Not exact, but very close. Mike again just couldn't stand to see it in the conditions, didn't took it home or rebuild it from the guts up. Uh, we rebuilt the time, the, the transfer cutter. Um, again, just some finishing details. <laughs> Happy customers. Uh, to put it mildly, um, since the car has been finished, uh, there is a group which still, you know, we primarily, the, the group's based primarily at Baltimore and then, you know, and helps in that area, but comes up periodically to handle the PCC maintenance for Rock Hill. Uh, on the right was a, a private charter um, earlier this summer. Um, and you can see here, just taken this year earlier, the finished car is held up really well. It looks good. Um, you know, Rock Hill's operating scheme, the PCCs don't run very often, but you know, it's a beautiful restoration. We've gone, we were really happy with the finished result and we try to keep, keep it up. And a lot of that work again was sponsored by the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys. So maybe you've been looking at this and said, wow, these are really fascinating, but these are pretty massive projects. You know, not, there's been more done. These are pretty massive. Hey, yeah, Kristen. Before we move on, I got a really interesting um, chat message um, for our international audience. Um, a, a lot of us in the U.S. here, we all know each other, and we know, you know, who does the decals and who does this and who does that. But um, if you could speak, maybe briefly or at the end, about um, maybe where to make connections or how to make connections, or for the international audience um, who can't, you know, get decals from Bruce. Um, what what some tips for them might be sure um let me offer a couple quick thoughts we can talk some more at the end sure. um you know contacts through um heritage rail alliance the former uh association of railway museums is a great way uh you can go to the heritage rail alliance website uh maybe chris at the end i can put that in the chat even sure uh, Harry and I don't know everything, but, you know, we both volunteer at several other museums. You know, you can reach out to us. Um, yeah, maybe they could email us after this. Yeah. We could we could do some research. Sure. Yeah. And uh, at the end, if you guys wouldn't, if you don't mind providing an email address. where right, people can reach right, All right. right. Sorry about that. Feel free to. No, no problem. <laughs> no problem at all. No, please. That's this is good stuff. Um, yeah, I'd recommend that. There are some public discussion boards. Um, some of them you, you get what you get. I mean, I would stay more towards the Museums Association, you know, and uh, like Harry and I are, are happy to provide our contact, you know, our emails and trust us what we don't know, you know, we can refer you to somebody who would. No, we're glad to get questions. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and go to car six from Newark and why? You know, I said, you may be thinking, well, these are pretty massive projects. Let's look at the other end of the spectrum. Let's look at a project that wasn't as massive and what the results look like. So car six. Um, for those that may not be aware, these cars were secondhand to the former Public Service Coordinated Transport of New Jersey. Uh, this particular car was built in 1946 for the Twin City Lines in Minneapolis and St. Paul. It was sold to New Jersey in 1953 and became their car six. Uh, it was moderately overhauled. Now, as Harry said, these were not rebuilt like a Philadelphia car was. The trucks were overhauled. There's a lot of work done on the interior. Doors were replaced. Uh, depending on the car, some wiring was done. Some cars were rather extensively rewired. Some weren't. Uh, it really depends. We found that through the maintenance logs for these cars. And the mechanics there knew which what they considered the better cars. Um, but again, they weren't completely rebuilt, but they would do things. Things failed. You know, they're pretty good about not just running until things dropped. Not as much as a rebuild, but, um, you know, something you could work with. The car was retired in 2001 by NJ Transit. And we're going to show in running condition. It was the last car painted. 
Unfortunately, it then sat outside for 10 years. Um, we embarked on a, a challenge to see in 2011, could we make the car run and cosmetically restore it in a four month period? It was a little hectic, but let's talk about it. It was, you know, as you say, some cars, you know, ran when parked or it was parked and sat in a field, sat, in, sat on the side of a mountain, was lived on. Car six, thankfully, was none of those. It was repainted in the early, uh, well, the mid 1950s colors before it was retired by New Jersey Transit. It was used for special events as well as service. Excellent condition. It was a running car two weeks before it was retired to change the brushes in one of the motors. They were still, you know, maintained it as if it was going to go on forever. But Unfortunately, I'll let Harry talk about this a little bit. Here's what it looked like after it sat outside for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, it, was it 2011 or 2010? Uh, 2010, we, we made the deal, but it didn't come till 2011. Right, right. Uh, they made three cars available to museums, six, five, and 10. So I went up to look at the three and uh, decided on six, uh not only because it had been recently painted but of the three it uh, 10 had been smacked in the rear had a big dent in it uh five had they had pantographs the last two years they operated it and five had a big hole in the roof from when they when they took out the pantograph so the water was pouring in so uh i chose six and i think i was right because it was the best of the three cars a little faded and you can see starting to show rust because it sat outside for 10 years. I still don't know why New Jersey Transit, they had, <clears throat> most of you probably know that Penn Station, all the cars fit inside downstairs in Penn Station out of the weather. That's where they were stored for almost 45, 48 years. Instead of leaving them down there until they disposed of them, some genius decided they should all be stored outside at the new car house out near Belleville. Why, I don't know. But as you can see, by 10 years, the damage was, was starting to really show up. But this car had a decent paint job in 01, so it wasn't as bad as some of the others. Also, with six, one of the funny things was it had it was one of two cars used to test the style of wheels they used on the LRVs called if you're really familiar with the industry and the technical decals, they were a Bochum 84 wheel. They look very different than a conventional PCC car. Um, you know, that may have been a distraction for some. However, they only had a few years of use. So uh, we were glad to take it because it had basically for a museum new wheels on it. Um, so what was the goal? You know, the, the intent was, can we get a literally a relatively cheap, it was a special deal, you know, they're not sold to general public, it was distributed to museums, relatively cheap, decent looking car that could be made to run for not a lot of work. Um, so this was the goal to make six looks like it did here in the late 1950s. So after, you know, various delays and winter, uh, we're able to move in April of 2011. That was a funny story in itself. Uh, New Jersey Transit had a track mobile they were going to move the car with. It was broken down. It spent months broken down. Finally, they decided to shove it with an L. It said, we'll move it with an LRV and with a skid loader and a chain. It worked. We were able to finally set a date and load the car. You can see how the paint on the roof is starting to deteriorate. The logo is gone. Nothing can't be repaired, but not what it looked like when it was retired. Um, these cars have the General Electric, what's called Mark 16 brake actuators. Um, those that have these may be familiar. You have to manually unwind these if your car is dead. Uh, you can see here we're manually unwi unwinding one. You can use the back of a reverse key or one of these special tools that uh, we're able to get. Um, you can also use, I want to say it's a three quarter inch drive socket, uh, but that's getting it ready to load. And that's its last night in New Jersey and Phillipsburg as it's making its way across to Pennsylvania. Now keep uh, in mind, by, by this time, 11 of the cars had already gone out to San Francisco to Muni. So yeah, in fact, as Harry said, this was the first one, the, this group uh, at that time, five and 10 were the first two after the Muni cars, uh, other than the ones that went to Cleveland to go to museums. So here it was unloaded the next day in Rock Hill Ferns. One of the first things we did was put it undercover, 
because it poured. It absolutely had poured the day we moved it uh, and let everything dry. It spent some time inside to just dry out. Um, so then we said, well, there's a member's day coming up. I think we could make it run. That became sort of a crash program. Um, it went through the car methodically, thankfully. NJ Transit did take very good care of the cars maintenance wise. We went through everything. You know, again, this is not something you just put the pole up and see what happens. Um, we went through methodically, cleaned, inspected everything. You know, if you want to say, for lack of a better phrase, system by system. Uh, the only damage we found was a broken spring on one contactor, which we were able to fix. Um, you know, we had to do some other work. Of course, the batteries are dead. Uh, do some work to the backup controller, which we'll talk about. We did have to mount a front pole. The panograph mounts made an ideal place for that. So then for the first time in 10 years, it ran at the museum's 2011 Members Day. Um, we did a short test run. If you look on the left, you'll see smoke. Uh, it's not electrical smoke, thankfully. We set the brakes a little too tight, came back, readjusted them, checked everything. Next thing was we carried people. You can see on the right, uh, the catcher isn't even working yet. It was not a public run, but uh, we were able to make it run in a matter of 38 days. So then we said, okay, the newer cars will have been retired 10 years in August. Can we cosmetically clean up the car for that anniversary? It's funny, there was later a comment posted, um, I believe online that said, well, they got the car and you know the paint was good. No, we had to repaint every inch of the car. Um, you can see here on the left, Rick Hoffmeister, Rick was a volunteer at Rock Hill. Um, he really got into it with us. You know, the car was entirely sanded down, cleaned. Uh, any of the worst of the damage that could be was filled. Um, you can see on the right, um, you know, you can see the roof progress. It shows you, you know, just how much the paint had faded. This was another lesson learned. Um, you know, sometimes the best of intentions. One of the participants in the restoration um, saw the rust and the scale. We were methodically trying to, you know, scrub off, clean off, if you want to say neutralize, proposed a uh, acid-based product to clean it. Um, unfortunately, in retrospect, uh, what wasn't done was that product is, is an acid. And from talking to a professional plumber and talking to someone else who works on antique cars, they both had the same conclusion that if you're going to use something like that, you really need to neutralize it, not just scrub it off. We think that may be why along the roof uh, above the standee windows, on this side of the car in particular, got the worst of this cleaner, that the paint has started to peel. Uh, and it's not started to peel the last layer. It started to pop at the bottom layers against the bare steel. Um, something we learned, not, you know, thankfully it's not the entire car. It only came up in retrospect, but we're not afraid to share, you know, some things you learn and they don't always turn out, but you know, that's something we didn't know at the time. It made a miraculous difference in appearance, but where it was applied heavy, we think is what's caused the original paint all the way down to the steel to pop off. Um, I said, not drastically in a couple areas because uh, we did use a proven product. We used a, um, a Sherman Williams industrial type coating that other museums have used. Other museums have used these on newer cars with good results. Uh, we did except for that area. But again, a lesson learned. The teamwork. This was another project where we got a group together. They really got into it, um, you know, inside and out, cleaned, and then got the car repainted. Newark in its later years painted the cars with high quality brushes and foam rollers. They did not have a paint booth. We did likewise. Uh, in fact, they gave us some tips on how to do it. We had some limited electrical pairs. Um, the car was in an accident shortly before it was painted gray in its last years of service. Uh, we couldn't get the headlight to work. You can see on the left why it was a series of splices. So uh, we obviously replaced that, made a new home run of wire. Um, the backup controllers had been disabled in Newark. Uh, we rewired it. We actually replaced it. We had a spare. We overhauled a spare, installed it, um, rewired it so the car could be easier for backup moves. Here you can see it's getting closer. The photo on the left, you know, still some more work to do, but the finished car is really starting to make its appearance. Uh, Harry and uh, Steve Gehring, you know, posed with the decal. Again, Bruce Wells helped us out. He had these decals made for us from a logo we provided. Uh, you can see the different appearing wheels. Uh, we did paint the, the 
The center's red as Newark did. We had some fun the night before. The car was done and we said, let's try to get some night photos. You can see it cleaned up well. Um, not a complete restoration by any means, but an improvement, a very low dollar, uh, a lot of effort, but low dollar improvement done by volunteers. Uh, we were able to clean up much of the original interior or as found, I shouldn't say original, but as found interior. Uh, we repainted most of that as well. So then we, again, you gotta have some fun with these. We did a ceremony almost to the day, 10 years after it was retired. Unfortunately, a hurricane was headed for the East Coast. So we did not get our New Jersey contingent, uh, but Bill Wall loaned us the banner, which hung on the last day of service in Newark. Um, so we, had a, we did have a nice ceremony at Rock Hill. Unfortunately, we couldn't bring out uh, the volunteer. A lot of the folks from New Jersey really could have enjoyed it. We even, with a car crash, a banner made up of logos that the car awarded by its different owners. Uh, did some, that Plymouth seems to pop up again. Uh, did some official photos with that. And here's looking 10 years later. How did the car do? This was last, the photo on the left was last summer. The other one was just not too many months ago. The car held up well. You can see overall, there are some areas we talked about the paint start to pop. It was, but the car's held up well. Again, Rock Hill doesn't run its PCCs very often, but um, you know, it's good the car has held up well. You can see the dramatic improvement, both it and 2743 from all the earlier photos. Um, it's a good example of a relatively low dollar way to clean up a car, but a car that can be. I mean, you can't do this with a basket case, but. Um, and the key, to, not the key, if I can interrupt there, the key yeah, to man. is keeping it inside. Absolutely. That's Absolutely, you have to keep them inside. Thankfully, this car's never lived out since it left New Jersey. So, all right, our last profile of the cars. We're going to talk about a, a, a brief truck overhaul, but this is the other end of the extreme with the newer car, car 26. Um, this car is three years newer, although it's identical. It's three years newer than car six. It was also from Twin City Lines and went to Newark, New Jersey, it became their car 26. This was actually the first car lightly overhauled for the 50th anniversary of the New York City subway in 1985. Um, as we mentioned, that is not a complete gut overhaul. They did a lot of good things in their car that extended service life. Uh, 2001, it was retired. And then in 2014, it was acquired by the Baltimore Streetcar Museum. Five years later of on and off work, it was operable. We'll talk about why. And it's currently undergoing a extensive restoration. So somebody could say a newer car, this is kind of interesting, why Baltimore? Well, Harry talked about that, really based on the success of 2168. Car 2168, rugged, reliable, takes the wear and tear off of the older cars. Um, public likes PCCs. This car has a pretty strong following, both in terms of interest and in donors from New Jersey. Baltimore is not too far from New Jersey. Baltimore is a Baltimore-based museum. But the car offers a lot of opportunities for that, you know, reliable, decent, rugged car. It also, the car on the left is the only surviving PCC car from Baltimore, the only, if you want to say, real one. Um, you know, it's one of a kind. So the things like the 26 and 2168 help save that wear and tear. 26 also can eventually be used with a platform based wheelchair lift. Uh, without destroying the originality of the car. There is one pole inside, one stanchion that would have to come out, but it can be done so that it will not damage the historical integrity and a wheelchair can land inside at that area. Uh, and that's part of the long-term plan. And there is a dedicated, enthusiastic, and a group in Baltimore that enjoys working on PCC cars. You know, and this is kind of funny. You never know what can happen some days. This photo was taken around 2001 by Harry. Um, some of these people may be familiar. Um, this was a group that included a number of people from Baltimore who would come up and meet with Harry and I, and we would joyride on the Newark City subway. Uh, the individual on the right, the late Jerry Kelly, you know, really liked these cars. Oddly enough, we found this is car 26. So you just never quite know. I mean, time flies. The young man on the left is now in his 30s. You know, of our active, some of our most active youth volunteers in Baltimore. Uh, one was a baby and one wasn't born when this car was running. But let's fast forward to the February of 2014. 
the car arrived in Baltimore and it was a standard gauge car. They work right on standard gauge, four feet, eight and a half. Now, to provide suitable trucks for the car, a set of former Philadelphia PCC trucks that had been regaged were used. We also made the decision at that time to make some modifications to the car's control system. Again, I don't want to, for the general audience, I don't go into excruciating details, but uh, what we had to do was the car as built used a general electric control system with general electric brakes. We converted that to use West to use Westinghouse shaft brakes with the GE car. That is not a plug and play briefly. I mean, that includes changing the braking cams, which I'll show a photo of. It includes changing the lockout relay, a number of other wiring changes in the car um, on and off for four years. The car had other ailments. We had to repair some wiring, replace some wiring, change the pilot motor, pilot motor resistor. 13 years outside were not kind to this car. So the first goal though was it got there to Baltimore, let's make sure it's protected and let's you know give it a good inspection. Unfortunately, not long after the car got there, graffiti artists liked it. One of our younger members just couldn't stand that and he went out and painted out all the graffiti on a Saturday afternoon and it didn't come back. That's now, before the car went inside. Go ahead. Can, I, can I jump in here, Matt? Take a look at this. Take a look at this roof seam when the car got here. Looks pretty good. All right. Looks pretty good. But we'll get we'll see more of that in a few minutes. So again, I'm not going to methodically walk through. And you know, if anybody wants to talk to me offline, you know, what did we do? You really want to get into the controls? I certainly can do that. But just as a visual, if you look the photo on the left, you're comparing what would be called the braking cams, okay? A series of switches that open and close for the general electric shaft brakes with the Westinghouse. And if you look at those numbers five, six, and seven, as well as eight, you can see how they open and close differently. We use parts from a uh, from a Philadelphia car that was stripped to provide the pieces, uh, but none of this is, like I said, plug and play. Uh, but the advantage is the Westinghouse brakes are much similar, simpler, and perhaps more than anything else, it made car 26 and 2168 electrically identical. So for long-term, you know, a new group of volunteers doesn't have two cars that look alike but aren't, you know, they're, they're much more comparable. And this is the same thing that SEPTA did when they rebuilt 2168 in the 1980s. Like I said, it had an extended stay. It was almost five years of on and off work. That's the shaft brake resistor we had to change. On the left, we salvaged that from another car. Um, a lot of work, a lot of time. As we're doing this, you have to keep interest up. So again, we use the mock-up theory. Uh, car came outside one day. We used, you know, relatively cheap paint, not something we would use for a finished car, just to show what it would look like to keep donors and others interested. Um, ironically enough, uh, on the left, you see the 1164 of Baltimore's double truck open car. That car is, has recently been extensively restored. It's almost done. Uh, the photo on the right, the uh, snow sweeper in the back was recently completely restored and uh, the next phases of that are in progress. So, you know, good things do change in time. So after four years of work, uh, we were finally ready to do a test run. And uh, you'd see the mocked up paints on it. It's a lot of different colors. Uh, we were able to get the car to go with the brake conversion. And we, uh, we invited what we thought were the three biggest supporters and fans of the car, Charlie Planthold on the left, Andrew Naughton on the right, and Ray Cannon, or Andrew Naughton in the middle, and Ray Cannon on the right to run that first trip. Car still needed a lot of work, but hey, we made it out and back. We were thrilled. Another group came and said, we really want to just ride one trip, and if we could do that, you know, we're going to make a, a, a grant, which they did. Uh-oh. Uh Problem was, if you look on your right, we found that the, what are called the field shunts, you can't really see them in the photo. They're actually up, uh, but you can see some of the char and the bird uh, had started to fail. That trip did them in, uh, but we had the spare parts from another car. We dropped that. It's rather heavy uh, resistor bank, dropped it, re replaced it, rewired it. And then success, the fall of 2018, uh, this was a special event. Um, you know, the car was not planned to come out, but a crew was working on it, and we made the first really ceremonial trip. The car was running better. Um, it has no doors. Obviously, we didn't carry the public that way. That's our master car, but it could work on the doors. But with a few exceptions, every person in this photo 
you can see even our master carpenter sticking his head out of the car inside in the yellow, worked on this car to a varying degree over a four year period. Um, a lot of work, a lot of frustration. There's still some more finishing work to do on the car's controls, but uh, we got that done. We said, we got to move forward with a car body exterior goal. Now, we debated a lot how to do the exterior. We chose this, the public service gray, much like car six, but there's a couple differences. You'll notice starting around 1959, the car's got the white fleet numerals. One, many of the same people who worked on car six at Rock Hill uh, now work on car 26. And we want to make it a little different. Also, Baltimore's last streetcar ran in 1963. We want it to restore 26 to represent what the industry looked like at that time. It's not a Baltimore car, it's not interpreted that way. But you know, what did the transit industry look like when Baltimore gave up the streetcars? Boom, here's 26, this is the goal. So one of the other things was we got a substantial grant a matching grant, which we're able to match fully, you know, rather rapidly from the 20th Century Electric Railway Foundation. Um, again, we had some experience with writing contracts. We wrote a set of specifications, a statement of work, and that supplement again that helped explain things with photos. We negotiated the contract uh, with Rail Mechanical Services Inc. in Columbia, Pennsylvania, uh, and that's where the car is being unloaded at this time in 2019. RMS has sold some of its business lines. Some of you may have seen that in Railway Age, but they did not sell the part that does car restorations or the short line railroad. Um, so and we've had nothing but really good success and high quality from RMS, which we'll talk about. So got there and work began. Well, you can see on the right, after we started to strip the roof, really what it looked like. 14 years outside didn't do any favors. Um, you see there, they're starting to grind off. They want to grind off some of the paint before they could attempt to water jet blast it. Now, can yeah. you go back, Matt, can you go back? Sure, and then I want you to talk about the wet blasting, Harry. Yeah, again, keep an eye on that seam. Notice how good the roof seam looks. <laughs> this was the roof, the results of 14 years outside. Uh, just remember that. Okay. Yeah, right around that blue, gray, and white area in the left, up by the windows. K keep a close eye there, as Harry said. Yeah, and this was the roof. All so right, Harry, we, what happened when they wet blasted the car? Well, they wet blasted. They decided we we should get get this car down to bare metal. Well, wet blasting didn't have much of an effect. We <laughs> figured out. Remember, Newark did not have a real paint booth. So every time the cars needed a paint job, they would just lightly sand it and roll and brush, rollers and brushes put another coat of paint on. So we estimated this car had at least nine coats of paint from its almost 50 years in Newark. So the wet blasting, you can see, hardly took any of it off. So we had to go and bring in a heavy duty sandblaster to get all the paint off which it did, but it also uncovered a multitude of sins underneath all that paint, which we were not <laughs> expecting. As, as our uh, fellow volunteer, Mike Lawson called it the truth serum. He yeah, said that's when yeah. the truth really comes out. Yep. Um, th these cars never went through the type of overhaul in Philadelphia. And as Harry said, eight to nine coats of paint, you know, which they quick, you know, they were able to get off with just sandblasting. And then we're able to, uh, you know, quickly prime so it didn't flash rust. But you can already see um, some of what was hidden under Bondo and paint and everything else in the car. And again, they took the rub rail off. Now this. Yeah. Go ahead, Harry. Let me let you go forward here. Yeah. This, after the paint was all off, this is what we found underneath. If we had just done a, uh, a quick sanding and a broom job, uh, all this would have been undiscovered and caused problems later on all this you can and see it. the deterioration down here by the rear windows all had to be rebuilt again when we started this project we had no idea it was this bad underneath the nine coats of paint so and you see another area that was that roof seam um, that was that roof seam i was telling you to look at this all came all exposed by the nine coats of paint that came off so obviously the steel repairs began. 
And you can see here, they started anything that was bad, cut out, shaped, welded it in. And then, you know, some of these, they, they were a little complex to make, you know, to get the curvature right, particularly along the area the roof is obviously curved and then it tapers down. Um, but they did a fabulous job with making the patches. I mean, that's just, if you're familiar with car body restoration, it's just step one. But again, these are the types of things with the PCC car, you know, a little different skills, say, than a, you know, a riveted conventional car. Um, you know, just a different skill set. Having someone, in fact, who later is doing the painting, paints buses really helped a lot. Um, you can see here more of the repairs. That's that area. You know, once they start to knock it out, you could see on the right. Go ahead, Harry. No, this, as you saw, this, when we, before we took the paint off, we had no idea that this all had to be rebuilt. And also by this time, the COVID had started. So now, it was uh, one person at a time worked on the car. The body guy and then the paint guy couldn't come in. And so they did, there was usually one person at a time working on the car because of the COVID. So that slowed things up. Now, that floor line repair, you can see, as Harry said, they took the rub rail off and that's such a critical repair. Uh, and I have another photo on the right. I know, you know, between the, the paint, or excuse me, the steel, some of the finish work, it's hard to see, but that's one of those stands they made, essentially, as we call it, the stands for the rub rail, um, you know, that they welded mm -hmm. on um, so that the rub rail could be mounted. Um, it can come off again, you know, they drilled taps, but then we also finished over it. And the next photo shows that a little more. You can see here, this is the rub rail. The one section is on, they made the stand. Uh, several sections of this they had to make new of. So we made nice steady progress with the exterior. And then Ed Amrine from Baltimore Street Car Museum called me, we were coming back, I was giving him the inspection report. I mean, one of the advantages of Columbia was, uh, thankfully it's close for Harry and I, we both don't live too far from there. Um, and Ed Amrine said, you know, we've been really successful with fundraising. This car is gonna be so beautiful. Let's do the interior. Let's try to raise the money and let's do the interior too. We originally, we're just gonna clean it up. So that proved to be a blessing in a lot of ways. You know, it's not just decorative. If you can see those lower supports, um, structural supports, this is after that stainless steel vent cover is removed. That's the heating duct on the car. Uh, cars that operate in colder climate uh, that had heat, not every car did, San Diego cars, for example, had no heat. Um, but it enabled RMS to get in and repair this. They also removed the ad card racks, as Harry talked about on the 2168. And in this case, several of the carlins, the, uh, the steel, if you want to call them rafters, were cut out where they were damaged and new sections welded in. We also, if you can see on the photo on the right, uh, installed new elements for the auxiliary heaters in these cars. They're old edge wound resistors. Um, in fact, the retired Newark shop manager gave me the specs and the part that they used. They had started to do these with some cars because they found if one of these shorts out, it's a 600 volt to ground short circuit. Uh, we said, if we got it apart and we don't do this, we're crazy. Now, to get to where the wire goes to a box underneath, we have to do that in Baltimore, but RMS made stands. They mounted them in again. Then they did the repairs to the structure, which proved to be a really wise idea. There was hidden damage under here. The seat frames. This was really cool. Uh, Harry, why don't you talk about Newark and its uh, love of salt on the platforms? Right, right. Now, the Newark cars never ran on salty streets like the Philly cars did. But the in Newark, on the city subway line, they had, at the different stations, outside stations, they had concrete platforms. And as soon as, soon as it would start to snow, the crews would just slit open bags of rock salt, spread it over the platforms, and the riders the next morning would track it all inside the cars. The interiors of this car was far worse than any Philly car we saw. All, virtually all of the feet, if you will, had corroded off because of salt. So all new feet, that's what uh, uh, Dennis here is doing. He had to, again, 
this this we hadn't planned on in the original scope. So this added more money to the price of the car. But all these feet had to be rebuilt by hand and then like a sleeve and put onto the bottom of the seat frame. Uh, all because of the salt that was tracked in for years and years from the platforms. Uh, the, the interior of the Philly cars never got that bad. And one of the interesting things, we don't have it here, but if you go onto YouTube, uh, operator Logan, Logan Tracy has a series of videos of restoration. He has one of this in progress. RMS actually made a jig to mount these in because the seats are, if you want to say the, the seat bottom actually slopes back. One side of each seat is mounted against the wall of the car, the other's on the floor. And each of these has to be angled properly to get this right. They took a series of measurements and made a fixture, a jig to hold the seat frame in so that as they, after they made the parts, they could weld them on and the angles would be dead on so that they would be correct and mount flush when they went back on. It was kind of ingenious and we're really impressed with what they did with this. So then, you know, you've done the seat frames. We've got to do something with the upholstery. The 1980s upholstery is what NJ Transit used on their over-the-road motor coaches. It was durable stuff. It, some don't like it. You know, I, I got that. But it would not look right in a car restored to 1960s appearance. So, Harry, why don't you talk about the seats? Yeah, let me jump in here. Uh, we had to replace all the windows because they were all Lexan and clouded over. And even the guys, well, before we had even decided to do the interior, the guys at RMS said, this car is going to turn out nice. You're not going to put those crappy windows back in. So we <laughs> said, okay, can we raise money for windows? So we went to Chaudron Glass in Baltimore and got a price. Uh, believe there's 28 windows plus the front windshields, plus the backs and the destination side. Bottom, bottom line is the, the windows, these were $80 a piece. And so now this is where social media comes in on this car. First time we use social media, thanks to uh, Logan Tracy and his operator, Logan, uh, uh, not a website, but uh, YouTube, YouTube, excuse me. He put up. He came down, we did videos, posted this. We got replies from California, Oregon, all over the country. Several people said, oh, I went to NJIT. I used to ride those cars in the 80s. Here's a check for two windows. We got a diner in Newark, bought three windows, all because of Logan's social media. The windows were paid for in... I'd say three months, four months. Right. So we decided to repeat the donate a seat program uh, that we did with 2743. Uh, the window, the seats are all paid for now. The car's not finished, but the seats are all paid for. We could not have done it without the social media. Uh, Operator Logan has done a fantastic job. So anybody that's restoring a car, uh, people seem to like to be able to donate a specific item. So we did the standing windows, the passenger windows, and the seats through. And this car, it went faster than 2743 because we used the social media, or Logan did. I don't know how to use social media, but <laughs> Logan does. So if you can get a young person that's really good with social media, uh, that's a big help in getting donations in. Absolutely. And it was a yeah. lot of fun. And, and we've been able to do the seats, which we're going to show some more of. Harry was able to get a match on the right type of material, the right color. We actually confirmed that with the retired shop manager in Newark. He said, boy, you guys got the right stuff. Um, it became fun. Uh, the flyer to buy the windows, uh, Dave Wilson for Baltimore Streetcar Museum. He's a really creative guy, a good writer. And you've seen the buy a brick campaigns. He couldn't help himself. He created one. Why buy a brick when you can buy a window? Yes. And it, yeah. it really took off. We'll show you that, you know, with some of the windows installed, we got new rubber. Uh, and this was, of course, the lower windows as well as the standee windows uh, in this case. We actually pulled, you can see the windows came out. Um, they still had the crank windows and we were able to do that. So we oh. also, <laughs> this... go ahead, Harry. Okay. Here. <laughs> the upholstery place is five miles from my house. So I brought the seats up, 
three, four, five at a time, the old seats. As they got repaired, I was going to put them all in my basement. But with the COVID, nobody was coming into my house. So <laughs> here, but this is my living room as we speak, full of 26's new seats. Uh, and they're still there. They'll be there until it gets back to Baltimore. I'm, I mean, why go to the extra work of taking them downstairs and bringing them back up? They're in my living room until, but they're all done uh, thanks to uh, the social media. Right, which we used as a match. The NRHS, uh, we got yep. two different chapters to endorse our grant, which was great. And we were able to get a grant to match the rest to get the seats done, which was, which was great because we did not want this to be a drag in finishing the car. So then with RMS's crew worked from the inside out. You can see the prep work here, a lot of prep. You can see that shows our new doors, Jerry Satarelli, our master carpenter. Uh, we had drawings for the correct doors, used a high quality marine grade plywood. These are, uh, oh, Jerry did just a fabulous job. I said he's a cabinet maker, master carpenter. Um, you know, Jerry is just a good guy. The, the snow sweeper in Baltimore was an Eagle Scout project. Uh, Jerry donated 100% of his labor to that car. Uh, all that was required to buy was the raw materials. Uh, it's just a fact, you know, I, I can't help but put a plug in for him. The doors he's made, the second set of PCC car doors he's made, and just, just a real craftsman. Uh, and we used a good, again, high quality marine grade plywood for durability. You can see here the interior painting was about wrapping up at this point. Uh, we color matched the interior, the dark color, and then the cream ceiling, which we're going to talk about a challenge of that in a moment. Um, one section of floor, they stripped the, all the rubber off, had to be replaced. Um, you can see the windows are back in. Each frame was polished. All of the window guards were polished. Um, the rubber was going in at this point. We bought new rubber. Uh, the paint quality is so good on the right. You can see Andrew and can see himself in it. Now, <laughs> this was an odd one. As Harry said earlier, the cars got panographs in Newark in their last years. We believe over time the hydraulic fluid leaked. Perhaps the when the panographs were removed, which was relatively early after they retired, there was a lot of hydraulic fluid. And then the car sat for a number of years. Rob, RMS's painter, found that that leaked in through the roof seams into the interior, the center section of the roof, as well as the exterior roof seams. One of the things he found is, is he would heat the car up, you know, he, he would get all the prep work done, paint it, and heat the inside of the building such to let the paint cure. But what that tended to do was then draw out any trapped hydraulic fluid, particularly if you got trapped between metal seams. We, we struggled to find what is this residue that tends to ooze out, and we finally, as best as we could tell, it was hydraulic fluid that had spilled, a line had ruptured, and it just sat. And the sat center, there for sat there for the 13, 14 years it sat up in Newark. And this area here, the center section, he had to do three times. He believes everything is drawn out at this point. You can't find any fluid. But it, like I said, it was funny, you know, cleaned everything, checked. But as he heated the car enough to, to paint, let it cure, that's when it would open the seams just enough. You know, the metal would expand and out came. I don't want to make it sound like it was a rainstorm, but you'd get this slime on it. And that, that was a really frustrating exercise. Uh, so we go back to the exterior, you see some final repairs before, okay, the steel before the, the additional prep coat. You can see we're test fitting windows. The windows are all back in. We're getting close here. Um, thanks to the generosity of Bill Wall, we were able to get a set of the correct style window frames actually from another newer car. Mike Lawson, again, a man of many talents, took these and restored these. We, put, we were able to work with them and new safety glass. Uh, this was test fitting. They had to make some shims to get them just right. Uh, you can see the uh, the operator's window on the left. Uh, we found in the maintenance log in the late 1960s, the car was in a front end, left front collision. And that strip was oh, yeah. made to fit the window because we found a block of wood had been installed, sanded and painted over after the accident. And we would not have found that wood under those nine coats of paint if we hadn't stripped them all off. Exactly. You can see here prep works going on. They did an initial base coat of the white around the windows. You know, just a, it's not the finished coat, but just to 
to get that down. We also, Harry mentioned, you know, you have to buy the, the Golden Glow headlights as a pair. Harry bought another set. Um, and then RMS, we worked with photos from San Francisco cars and was able to reconstruct the correct style, um, the way the dash held a Golden Glow window or Golden Glow headlight, excuse me. You can see that being test mounted. A lot of research went in. We gotta say that we gotta put a plug in for our friends at Minnesota Streetcar Museum. Just a wonderful group of people. If you're familiar with Newark cars, they restored former Newark number three, Minneapolis 322. Jim Vacunas and Aaron Isaacs are just two wonderful people. They gave us a lot of advice with the car six. We've come back with the 26, that's actually car 26 on the left at the Minnesota State Capitol. That helped us you know, understand some of the details in the car. That helped us get the right tint. The standee windows actually have a green tint. They did until uh, they were replaced in the 1980s with plastic. We were able to get Chaudron glass to tint the windows to the correct shade of green. Um, but again, questions, detail, answering, no, we, we found this. What is this? Um, the Twin City Line logo even made a reappearance. It wasn't right here. <laughs> Yeah, under the last coat of paint. Uh, the car turned yellow and green again at the very end. You know, we said we really want to do this right. Um, you can see some of the other examples. We restored Mike Lawson, restored the taillights and the markers in the rear. And notice these have the red stoplights, the cat's eyes. There's Mike with a restored fare box, the correct type, not just cosmetically, but it works. It makes that some call it the coffee grinder. Uh, we're able to get through purchase, through donations, the correct public service uh, time card holders that take one boxes. We got an international R11 fare register. Mike restored this. It shows its restored state. The side destination sign, so much water had leaked in. This was essentially rotten out. We had a spare from Philadelphia. We got another one. Mike took the pieces of two and made one replacement unit. Yeah, on the original one, this whole top piece was totally full of cancer, totally gone because of, the, because of all, all the water. More details. Mike restored uh, the, um, the data plate or the, the plate for the gang switch, the operator's console. We, we got one of the, we got a original, not necessarily from this car, but St. Louis Car Company builder's plate. Uh, the front then had been painted shut for probably since the 1960s. This was another Mike Lawson took it home, rebuilt it, restored it. Um, you know, most of these, I said in later years, are under a lot of paint. We actually got it off. As Harry mentioned, every piece of glass was replaced, all the rubber, uh, the stainless steel uh, heater duct covers were taken and polished. There's Harry and I with the sandboxes. One of the interesting things SEPTA did when the cars were overhauled was replace the galvanized sandboxes with stainless steel. Why? Because wet sand tends to rust out the steel. Newark didn't. The sandboxes were just atrocious. Uh, Ed Amrine arranged with a uh, a company in Baltimore does stainless steel fabrication to make two new stainless steel sandboxes. We restored all the window cranks. Mike did that. Uh, there's a common misconception. People say they're identical to a model Buick crank windows. They're not. They may be similar, but the PCC cranks actually have a slip clutch inside. That's why if you ever cranked one up, you get to the top, you still crank and the window won't go up. And the window won't move, but the crank will. Mike figured that out. Mike took them all down and restored them again. So they'll go with the finished windows. Uh, our master carpenter, Jerry Satterelli, made a set of new roof cleats and roof boards for the car. We also said we want to look at the pole bays. You know, and Bernie Orient from Pennsylvania Trial Museum was a great resource for this. He helped Mike Lawson and I. Mike stripped one down, rebuilt it. It was an educational experience. You may not think of your pole bases very often. Um, yeah, one of the springs was totally broken off right here. So we're able to get a spare, exactly. And uh, these do have grease fittings. These are probably an overlooked maintenance item. Um, check your shunt, that braid. If that deteriorates, it eats away through electrolysis, the internal parts of one of these. Uh, this was eye-opener. I expect in Baltimore we're going to rebuild more pole bases in the future. It was rather eye-opening. Again, you know, a plug for Pennsylvania Trial Museum. Bernie was a great resource for this to us. So as we got, as the car moved along, one of the really interesting things were we want to do this historical accuracy uh, from our friends at Brantford. 
they got us a set of interior ad cards from northern New Jersey and the New York City area around 1964 for what was used in their Hudson Manhattan card. We were able to get a couple more. We collected one for Newark College of Engineering or NGIT now, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Mike Lawson said, you know, these cars often look like rolling billboards. Can we do something with the exterior short of drilling through the sides and putting the ad card racks on? So we weren't able to get really good photos, but we did some research as to what type of exterior ads these cars had. They had a lot for Palisades Park in New Jersey, some for the 1964 World's Fair, Valentine Beer, and some of the shore resorts like Asbury Park, um, because connecting trains to Point Pleasant and Bayhead as well, the Asbury Park connected to Newark with these cars. So what we've been doing is collecting vintage advertisements, and we plan to have magnets made so that these can go on the car. We can also take them off for cleaning and for times we don't want ads. So we've been working on getting exterior ads. These are just some of the samples we're working on, the 1964 World's Fair. Uh, Ballantine beer was popular. We're trying to set the correct period for the car, and this has been a lot of fun. The trucks. We mentioned it has a set of Philadelphia trucks under it. They weren't in the best of shape, but they were available. We have a second set of Philadelphia trucks from the Philadelphia trucks that were overhauled late in the car's life. Uh, what we've done is drain and flush the gearboxes, all of the bearings. We've inspected the gears. We're making new gaskets for the gearbox covers. Um, we've also cleaned them down or in the process of painting them. No, that's not the finished color. You can see the primer. We inspected all the motors, cleaned all the traction motors. You can see we insulated uh, the inside of the motor covers again. Um, we're in the process now of making new rubber stop blocks for the trucks. So let's talk about where 26 is now. Uh, these are some photos from a couple of weeks ago. You can see the finish. This is the on the rear section of the roof. That's the finish coat, the finish colors. This section on the roof, and it's in Logan Tracy's most recent video. One area alone took 38 hours of labor to get right. There was a lot of rust, a lot of rot, and apparently at one time in Newark, it was sport to throw bricks and cinder blocks off of overpasses onto the roofs of the cars. Um, the maintenance log is riddled with entries where windshields were taken out this way. Uh, there were some pretty hefty dents. And Harry, nine coats of paint were hiding all this, weren't they? That's right. Yeah, remember that roof I showed you in the very beginning? This all had to be repaired. And the hydraulic fluid showed up again on the outside roof. Uh, again, Rob had trouble getting the primer to stick. Uh, and it took him almost a week to solve the problem. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what he treated it with, but he finally got the primer to stick. So there were a lot of unforeseen, unexpected problems uh, that we didn't really know were going to happen when we started this pro this restoration. You can see here more of Rob's work. That's that roof seam again. You can see really. Um, you know, yeah, remember of, this in the beginning. This had all that corrosion right here. That's all been repaired. This area shows again more of the seams. You can see the lighter area was an area he hadn't finished yet. Uh, if you're familiar with the way PCC cars are constructed, you know, there's a photo in one of the books, the end sections were actually made in a wooden jig. And then, um, you know, if you want to say welded on the car body, we made in this jig and the car body was built around it. Rob tried to focus on that and then blend it, the seams in. We stripped the car, you can see the seams. Because um, he said this area, he basically had a sculpt back to shape, uh, but you did a fantastic job. You can see here more of the work uh, as the center roof sections where the hydraulic fluid was, the lighter areas had been done. He was about ready to finish it. Again, we use the all grip paint. It's a uh, urethane base. Uh, we carefully matched the public service colors to something in the all grip catalog. Um, yeah, you know, we feel very successful with that. Uh, we actually had one of the younger members, we were selecting what would be the most appropriate paint off an original chip. Uh, we actually used a teenager who was the only person who didn't have eyeglasses to get the color right for us. And again, this shows some of Rob's work just this past week. The area that had been uh, ready for paint is now done. Um, you know, the car is estimated to be finished around the middle of June, and then I'll come back to Baltimore. More areas Rob did. These are the MG vent covers. You know, these were the, the grab irons on the roof. We took them off you know, to get under them and, and treat them properly. 
We talked a lot about social media. This was fun, actually. We were able to photograph Logan Tracy doing his most recent video as Harry and Andrew Naughn explain some of the details on 26. Um, social media has paid dividends on this. So at 26, like it said in this ad that was used in the older cars in Newark when they were coming, we look forward to saying you'll be riding in car 26 soon, probably early 2022 at this point. Uh, maybe for those of you in the museum community that go to the annual Cabin Fever Winterfest, um, you might have a special treat with this car. There's about six months of work left when it comes to Baltimore, some finished electrical work. Um, we have to um, put the decals on. Uh, of course, the heaters we mentioned have to wire and then put the seats back in it. But um, they're estimating about six months, test the car out, and we'll be ready to really roll this one out. So as we start to get to the end of this presentation, I know we've gone a lot longer than we thought, but I want to briefly talk about one other profile. It's much shorter, a truck overhaul, and then some final wrap-up comments. Um, this next project is with the National Capital Trolley Museum. It's an overhaul of a set of B2 trucks that were used under the former Toronto Transit Commission car 4603. Now, what was the goal here? You know, this is very different than the other projects. Uh, you'll see in some of the, in a moment, there were some damaged components on these trucks and then I'll show you what they look like. And the goal was to, to repair the damage and overhaul these to provide something that's safe for long-term use in the museum environment. I wanna be clear on that. You know, this is, the overhaul was it has to be safe. It has to be reliable. But we weren't looking for something that it needs to put up with the demand, say, of service in like San Francisco. You know, we're not running the cars in very heavy service. But at the same time, we are not, compromising on something that would be less than that. It's a matter of what is safe, what is reliable, what is maintainable, um, you know, but realizing it is a vintage car, which is not going to be used in transit service. Um, the contract for this, what we did was we set a not to exceed price. We worked with the contractor because we weren't able to just get at everything. You know, if you really want to see every bearing, every component of PCC truck to do it right, you have to tear it down. We didn't have that option. So what we did was we set up to a ceiling price. You know, we put different light items in um, and said, you know, if you reach the ceiling after that, we will negotiate for any cost beyond that. Uh, that's worked out really well for this type of work. Um, Lions Industries in Evansburg, Pennsylvania was awarded the contract. Um, as many of you may have worked at Lions, absolute pleasure to work with. They had not done a PCC car truck project before. Uh, but they have the know-how to do this type of work. Um, they've been nothing but a partner. And really, you know, I, I can't say enough, Lions does good work. So, you know, what was wrong with the trucks? Well, if you look at the photo on the left as they're being towed, um, you can see whole, you can see the spacer bolts are removed. You can see on the right after they're taken out, a number of these were found to be cracked and stripped. Also the cheek plates, those plates that are on the front and back of the wheel were stripped. Um, these trucks came from Cleveland, their former shaker. They had a lot of wear and tear on them. Um, probably the best way I can say it. Um, you know, yes, the Toronto cars were kept in very good shape, well maintained, retired in good shape. These trucks did not come from Toronto. Some parts in them did, but these are former Shaker Heights trucks that had a lot of use on them. But there were some good things. For example, the swing links, um, those round, they look like bushings. You know, we're in very good shape. That's why we did that not to exceed. You know, <laughs> inspect everything, give us a report, and say what does it cost. Um, some surprises though. We did find some frame cracks around that mount where the brake actuator mounts. It's that thing that has those two studs sticking out. The rubber wheel sandwiches were rusty and pretty much shot. Um, again, not unexpected. We put in to inspect the contract, to inspect everything, and then you know, up to a certain dollar, we would negotiate beyond that. Um, the motors, the insulation resistance came up, the mega came up. Okay. Well, we had the option to overhaul the motors. We said, crazy if we don't. The track brake wiring was pretty much shot. Um, you know, not unexpected. We figured that. So that wiring is all being replaced. Um, whoops. I want to go back briefly because it shows the truck frame. You can see the wheels are removed. The hubs are removed. There is an inner seal. It's a mechanical seal. Um, it's in the Clark Equipment book on B2 trucks. They say it last, they were designed to last the life of the car. Again, I don't think Clark Equipment expected these cars to still be around. Lions is manufacturing new seals. With the rubber wheel inserts, 
you know, what do we do? This is where cooperation plays so important. Baltimore Streetcar Museum and the National Capital Trial Museum have always had a really strong partnership and relationship. Baltimore had some new old stock, if you want to say, and some were used, but good stock, good rubber, uh, wheel sandwiches. They saved a lot of money for their friends in National Capital. They donated to them the wheel sandwiches needed for this, as well as spacer bolts. Baltimore got a box of spacer bolts from SEPTA, more than they could ever use a number of years ago. We wrote in the contract to have them non-destructively test it. We gave them more bolts than were needed uh, to be sure the test came up fine. That saved a lot of money. Again, Baltimore also made new cheek plates uh, so the holes could be drilled and tapped out properly. A couple wrap-up photos of this profile. You can see the motors uh, they were taken out, new field coils wrapped, cleaned, dipped, baked. The armatures were cleaned, dipped, and baked, restored to like new. They did not read rewinding, thankfully. Uh, the brake actuators were broken down, disassembled, cleaned, and rebuilt as well. Where we are now is finding some of the rubber components. Um, these are the original TRC drawings for a B2 truck. Um, we've not been able to find a vendor yet that makes these. So we're doing something in parallel. Lions Industries is looking to see what they can have made uh, for these. We're also working with urethane. It's a tip Bernie Orient gave us for the rubber and the pole base. And Mike Lawson is looking at ways to make these perhaps out of urethane, uh, the same value, the durometer, if you want to say the, the spring value, for lack of a better phrase, of the rubber, um, to see if we can use that. Um, so we're working on that now. These trucks are slated to be done this summer. Uh, the rubber could throw us for a little bit of a curve, but the first truck not shown here has been you know, about 90% reassembled and they're starting on the second truck uh, based on what they learned on the first, but a lot of the components are out. Uh, things are moving pretty rapidly at this point. But it shows you again, you know, another type of project. Don't neglect your trucks. Um, you know, something good to do, you know, you can go all the way. There are, you know, you can look at commercial, uh, what a transit agency uses for its specs for truck rebuild, probably would go a lot further. This was, if it can be reused and it's safe to reuse it versus throwing everything out and starting over. Another, this is the, the bolster stop for a B2 truck. So as we wrap up, let's talk briefly about maintenance and sustainment and then our final comments. So, we talked a lot about being able to maintain one of these cars and understand that you really need to have information. Um, you know, the two biggest things, information and experienced people. Uh, and you know, people willing to learn. If you can talk to people who do this for a living, did it for a living, that's so valuable. Um, but, you know, some of the OEM manuals, you know, call them, are still around. Like I said, you know, some of the friends Philadelphia trolleys do is try to share these other museums, you know, whether it be the GE equipment book or the Westinghouse book. Those renewal parts catalogs are a blessing uh, because a lot of times they show an exploded diagram. You know, what, is a, what does a GE contactor look like? Here you go. It shows it taken apart. Um, you know, the GE floating control book talks about maintenance tips. I think that's the one that shows you how to take out the KM unit. Um, you know, the schematics, the electrical schematics are key. The Association of Railway Museums some years ago reprinted the PCC maintenance practice manual. It was done by the Transit Research Council, what the industry did for maintenance. It's a great resource. You can see how many miles, what type of grease they used, who did what and who didn't and why they did or didn't. Um, you know, as we, we mentioned, specific equipment instruction like the Clark book, that was a, a real find, you're able to get a hold of that. Subject matter experts, the people that lived it, that did it, uh, people like John Lacoste in Baltimore, who rewired a complete Westinghouse air car, you know, the, an invaluable source of information and a great guy. Uh, and working together, you know, it, it, you've heard us say that throughout, you know, this museum did this, helped us, did this. Did, that's the key, really. And just to give examples, you know, what these things look like, the SEPTA PCC maintenance uh, training course. A lot of people give SEPTA a bad rap. This book is excellent. What it describes is, it's from the 1970s, a Westinghouse air car, a Westinghouse all electric car, a GE air car, a GE all electric, and in narrative form, the sequence of how something works and what it does. It's a great reference. Uh, some of the friends of Philadelphia Trolleys have scanned and made available. This is what one of the general electric equipment manuals looks like. Uh, these often have the renewal parts catalogs and exploded diagrams in it. There are some specialized tools. This is an example of the type of meter 
need it. You can see the specs on the box on the right side. If you're really into this, it's a works off a 300 amp to 50 millivolt shunt. You know, I'll go that. I'll stop there. I know not not everybody wants to be interested in this stuff, um, but if you're going to do things like work on a limit relay or work on an accelerating braking relay, you need something like this. So put a cautionary note out there. Things like that on a PCC car, you just don't want to tear into and you just don't want to play with. You really want to do your homework, talk to somebody who's worked on them, you know, and really learn how these cars work. It is not rocket science. They are very logical. But there are, you know, some of the things you can get away with on an older car, you can't get away with on a PCC. And safety has to be first. And there's another example. This is the Clark PCC manual for B2 trucks. This is great. I've scanned this, with, you know, shared this in a number of museums. This tells you the oil type, you know, where the drain plugs are. If these things are covered in grease, rust, filth, and everything else, you know, finding where these plugs are, like I said, for the 26, we drained everything, flushed everything. Um, you know, things like this are a great resource is the bottom line for this. So you restored that car, you preserved that car. What do you want to do? Harry talked a lot about coverage, why that is so important. You saw what happens in their left hand. You know, don't make that mistake with a finished car. Building condition matters. You know, not everybody, not every museum has the resources to have a first class building. Understandable. You know, I would say that is an aspirational goal. Um, you know, coverage is important. You gotta be careful. You know, if you ask the guys who work on old cars, the ladies who work on old cars. Rats love old wiring. You don't want them chewing around your car. You know, moisture below. Areas that have a high water table, a lot of groundwater, you know, a vapor barrier, concrete floor slab. PCCs can rot from the bottom up too. Contactors can get oxidized, filthy, dirty. Um, you know, they do need periodic maintenance. It should be appropriate to the type of use the car gets, but running a PCC car to where it breaks is not a strategy for long term. You know, a little work saves a lot of, you know, a little bit up front saves a lot later. PCC cars also don't like to sit idle for long periods. Interlock stick, contactor stick. They just don't run well. You know, it, it, they need periodic operation. If you let it sit months at a time and try to run it every once in a while, it's probably not going to perform that well. Um, but at the same time, you can't run out the problems in a car. Uh, we talked about that. You know, they really do need care and maintenance. And quite frankly, it's not, you know, for someone who's mechanically inclined. I don't want to intimidate anybody. You know, these have things like grease fittings and, you know, parts you can get to. Things are laid out. It's not like a conventional car with plain bearings. You know, PCC cars were designed with maintenance in mind, and that's about it, the benefit. So to wrap up, you know, have a plan. We talked about what are your goals? What are you after? But also be flexible. Plan for changes. You got to be transparent to your donors and sponsors. I think it goes without saying, but like as Harry talked about the 26, one of our videos, we explained why is this taking longer? Well, we had COVID, we found this, we found this. You know, it's really important. Uh, keep people engaged. You know, it's if it's not going to get done on a certain time, tell them. If it's more than you bargained for, you know, tell them. Yeah, you know, cooperation teamwork is everything. You know, having the right group of people, and it's not just talented people. You know, I, I'm one. You know, rather than have the super smart one person who does everything, let's build a team. Um, we have one guy that works with us in Baltimore and National Capital and elsewhere. He'll tell you, I don't bring a lot of mechanical skills, but that guy will do anything. When you're deep in work in something, he'll go get your tools, go get your parts, he'll clean things up. You need people like that. You need a team. It, it, so much more gets done. You know, nobody knows everything. It's a lot of fun. I mean, the group of us, Harry and I have been friends for a long time. You know, the guys that we work with in Baltimore and we travel to the national capital and elsewhere with, you know, guys like Mike and Logan. We have a lot of fun together. You know, we do this. We have a good time. We celebrate when things go well. Um, you know, it's more than just you finished a car. You build a team. You've done something good for history. And it's just a lot more fun. I'll end with a final note. Some of you, if you've heard one of our presentations before, have heard this, but if you knew the late Ken Rucker from National Capital Child Museum, Ken was just a neat guy. But he said to me, we would meet periodically for lunch. And he said, you know, things have changed in the museum community. Projects, and this was his quote, are becoming community-based. In the future, cooperation between museums will be how things get done. 
you know, we hope if you leave with nothing else today, other than some interesting things we do with PCC cars, the cooperation between museums and building a team. You know, if I can leave you with anything, if Harry and I can stress one thing more than anything. Okay, and Matt, can I just uh, come in here? You sure end? can. Yeah. If you're going, to, if you're thinking of restoring a PCC car, get a person that's good with social media. We <laughs> found on 26, Operator Logan, between the seats, the standing windows, and the 28 regular window, he brought in about $12,000 in donations for that car in a little over a year. So try to get a, a social media person. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on any, I don't, I don't know anything about it, but I know it's valuable. The other thing is every museum or many museums always have a group of people that don't like PCC cars. And I just say, if you want to fix one up, don't let them get you down because they'll try to do it. Amen. Well, Kristen, do you want to open the floor for questions? I can stop sharing and we can, for those that hung in there, I'm sorry, sure. I got so long. Quickly, before we get to questions, um, first of all, I want to thank you guys so much for that presentation. Um, we will get to questions in just a minute. But before we do, I want to let folks know that we do have some other presentations coming up. Next one will be May 19th. And then uh, Matt will actually be back with his son, Andrew, uh, for a presentation about Hanover PA. And, um, and we'll keep doing these about every month and uh, continue well into the fall. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you enjoyed the program, please consider making a donation at patrolley.org slash support. You can support us in other ways too. At the link, you'll see um, how you can become a member or a volunteer here at PTM. And thank you again to everyone who donated during the registration process for this program tonight. We sincerely appreciate that. And I uh, invite everybody to turn on their videos now, if you'd like, you don't have to. Um, if you cannot turn on your video, please let me know. I did come along and um, turn a couple of, the, of them off during the show, just because they popped up there. So just send me a message in the chat uh, if you can't turn on your video and I'll come around and, and ask you to turn it on if you'd like. Um, but uh, a, a couple questions did come in at the end and I will let everybody unmute themselves too in just a second here. But let me ask this question first. Um, from Paul Grether, does the APTA Heritage Trolley Vehicle Standard ever get used in the trolley museum slash preservation movement for determining how to be safe with operating and maintaining this old equipment? I'll offer this. Um... I've recommended it to different museums as a guide. I've shared it with other people in the museum community. I don't know anyone that uses it like the transit industry does for vintage vehicles, which I'm glad Paul mentioned. If you're familiar with that, it's a whole different set of standards. And the APTA standards are superb. I think for museums, they're really aspirational. But I would encourage anyone, you know, they're publicly downloadable. Um, if you follow what's in there, you know, you want to say you're doing things as safe, you know, as you can and at a level above, that's what's to use. I mean, like I said, I've shared those other people in the industry. They asked me, museum industry, I should say, hey, and I said, look, here's the link. Download them, read them. They have some, I'm glad you mentioned it, that they're excellent is what I would recommend. Great. And um, before I forget, um, you did mention that collaboration is key between museums. Is there a good place for people to reach you and Harry? Sure, why don't I, Harry, if you're good with the two, I'm gonna put our emails right yeah, in. put our right emails right up now. there. Sure, I'll do that right now, so just bear with me. Um, Great, and everybody should be able to unmute themselves now. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question directly, we're getting some nice comments in the chat. Um, if you'd like to ask a question directly, you should be able to unmute yourself. And I do apologize, you know, we went, a lot longer than we bargained for. And I have to say, if you come to the, the Hanover presentation in June, my son Andrew has already said, Dad, you're not talking for two hours. So <laughs> <laughs> he said, you better be a, a lot less than that. <laughs> but I hope people found this, this good. And like I said, I do apologize. We ran a lot longer. I hope it was still good use of your time. It was a, re 
It was a real quick two hours. I enjoyed it, even though I'm no longer doing mechanical restorations. Oh, great. Well, hey, we're, we're glad. Like I said, I know I try not to kill people with time. Um, <laughs> and I see uh, we had a question from Brian. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Um, so, so first, first of all, thank you, Matt and Harry, for the presentation. It was, it was, was really good and really informative. Um, I know when, when you were talking about some of the, the SEPTA cars you were working on, you mentioned briefly, um, and forgive me, I, I forgot the car number, but the, the, um, the, the Philadelphia Air car that's in Scranton, I believe. Yeah, 2054. Um, so, so a couple questions. The, the first one is, is have you, have, have, have you ever, or have, have you all been, doing any have, have you all been doing any work on that car um and mm -hmm. how, how um how, how would um other, other than some of the the obvious um mechanical things what would some of the the differences be when you have a um in in old uh, in in older a pre-war uh pcc like that um and one one that did not go through septa's um general overhaul program sure Sure. Why don't I, Harry, I'll kick it off and jump in. Okay. Um, you know, we've talked to Electric City. You know, we know Mike Tristino real well. We've done projects. We've given grants to Electric City. You know, they've asked us that if they put a plan together in the future, would we keep that in mind? And we said, certainly. Um, you know, the biggest thing is after many years outside, they got the car undercover and dry, which is huge. I mean, inside, undercover. Now, Things that come to my mind if that car was to be restored. You know, first, a really comprehensive inspection. It did sit outside a long time. Now, that vintage of car would have had originally a wood, wood roof covered with canvas in the center. Now, I believe SEPTA later replaced that with steel. Yes, they, yeah, in the, in the 70s and 80s, they replaced the ones that were still in service with steel. Um, Things that I would tell you, Brian, just off the top of my head, you know, every car is subject to inspection. Because one of the things is some places ran things to failure, some places didn't. You know, how do I put it? You can have two cars in the same fleet where one is pretty decent and one is not. Um, it really depends, you know, what we would what you would find underneath. I would assume the wiring probably all needs to go. Um, that is a challenge in a PCC car, the wiring trough runs on the left side of the car, you know, which is not only the, not all of the wiring, but it runs there. Um, like years ago in Baltimore, Ed and John LaCosta cut, took the floor out, cut that conduit open from the top and made it she could open it and laid all new wires in rather than pull them through. I would assume that that would probably need to be done to 2054 unless selected repairs were done. Things like the contactors, uh, the Westinghouse controller, if they were well maintained or rebuilt as they failed, that's one thing. If they were run till they dropped, uh, you know, using 7407 again for an example, they rebuilt every single contactor in that car. Everyone came out. The coils were replaced. The hey, Matt. pins were hey, done. Matt. Everything. Sure. Matt, uh, don't forget, 2054 is a 1935 Model B body. It's completely different from an all-electric post-war car. To an extent, you really got to look at the original TRC specs, George. If you can get a copy of them, I think, you know, uh, some of the information. The construction is totally different. The construction, you know that. Yeah, the, Part construction of the frame construction is totally different. Partially. It gives you the greatest steel, how it's built, everything. The roof, it, it's not quite the same as the 1935 Model B. There are some other changes. You really, in fact, you look at the 37 specs versus, I want to say it's the 40. You know, there are slight changes. They are different. There's some similarities, some things different. Yeah, the car was built in 41. I think also you got to remember Electric City Trolley Museum runs from, uh, basically runs using double-ended cars only. It has no way to turn a car. Right. right. And this PCC is a single-ended car. So this, I would say, you know, there may not be a lot of incentive to restore it, even though they're working very hard on the double-ended uh, traditional uh, Philadelphia car for restoration. Right. I mean, and, and, you know, for my take, that's what I would do. Let's say, you know, they asked us to come in and look at it. I mean, that's really their decision. I mean, Rockhill Trolley Museum has two single-ended PCCs. 
they don't fit in their operating scheme like their double-ended cars do. That's why they don't run all that often, but they do run them occasionally. Um, whereas Baltimore, I mean, something like the 2168, a loop at each end, I mean, it runs all the time. National Capitals, Toronto cars, particularly now the 4602. That's their bread and butter car. Like you said, you know, a loop at each end makes a big difference. Absolutely. Um, Brian, I saw, going back to you, how the scope of restoration would change. Some things wouldn't be all that different. Something you would have to account for is the air brake system itself. Uh, you don't find that, obviously, in an all-electric car. Uh, my own experience with air brake systems on vintage street cars, not necessarily PCC-based. Um, something that sat a long time. You can figure every seal is shot. It probably every air operated device at least needs to come down cleaned and inspected. Um, Mike Lawson, Harry and I and others occasionally help the Mannheim Historical Society. They have that single truck Bernie there. Um, Mike rebuilt the door engines for that. He, I've done a number of those for other cars. He and I did those. He did most of the work. And as he said, everything was filled with dirt, with sludge. We replaced every seal. That's something with an air brake car when you get into the brake mechanism itself. If it's sat a long time, my opinion, you don't do that. You're just asking for trouble. And I would the door operators. Go ahead, Eric. I was going to say, I would probably think that 2054 would be a send out rather than restored at home. Probably, probably. I'm looking at the comments too. Rich uh, Krisak asked, the Kinky Shario plant in New Jersey. Yes, there's an NJ Transit PCC and some work cars there. The work cars are owned by North Jersey Electric Railway Historical Society. They're stored there. The PCC car number 28 is still, as far as I know, the property of NJ Transit. They actually did a lot of work on the car. Some years back, it was stored at Hudson Bergen. Um, they did a lot of body work. They repaired the backup controller, uh, got the car to go. Uh, it was then painted before it was on display, but it's, it's on display. I don't know what the ultimate fate is, but uh, that was car 28. And they did do a lot of work. Um, you know, do, I don't know as extensive as 26, but then again, you know, each car is a little different. Matt, one question going back to air brakes. Um, in your experience, do the air brakes on PCCs or I suppose uh, bro liners might count for this too. Is there any parts commonality on them with automotive or truck air brakes of the time? Hmm. That I'm not 100% sure of. Um, that would be interesting. You know, if it's a Westinghouse system, it was like Westinghouse used for heavy vehicles. I'm not exactly yeah. sure. Um, because there's a lot to go out there on those. Right. Um, you got to have the, the Bible according to Bendix Westinghouse <laughs> right here. And wow. It would be amazing if some of this stuff was in common with electric railways. I'm trying to find the one page. They actually even give you a drawing of what every gasket is shaped like wow. in here. I can't wow. find it right away, but just kind of curious if you'd ever run across something like that. No, I, you know, it's funny. I've never attempted that as a cross reference. That's an interesting idea with some of the seals maybe and things like that. Um, wow, you got me on that one. That I. I don't know. Um, yeah. Well, if I can just echo one thing Matt said earlier, technical manuals, they're awesome. If you can find them, guard them with your life, but also share them with anybody who, you know, could benefit from the info. Great. Any other, I'm trying to skim the comments and I apologize. wasn't able to go through as we did them. Um, you know, Rich brought up a good point. Yeah, Boston used trolley bus air components on some cars. Yes. Um, funny story with that different application. The uh, uh, the double truck of Porto car at the Rock Hill Trolley Museum, car 249, has a has a former Wilmington trackless trolley compressor in it. Um, that does the job in that. Uh, trolley bus air components, sure. Uh, Boston also, if you really went in the technical details, as many of you know, replaced the, the PC2 model air compressor that most PCCs use, the belt-driven one with an older style, a DH-16. Uh, Baltimore did the same with their cars, um, used an older reciprocating compressor versus the belt-driven piece. But that's interesting, Rich. I never knew that about using the trolley bus air compressor. That's, that would make sense. 
we have any other questions for Matt and Harry, um, again, I mentioned that one that I got uh, earlier in the program. Um, I think it was from someone in Canada. Um, I mean, obviously, they're a lot farther away from the East Coast museums. I mean, you know, so are the people on the West Coast, I guess. But um, he had asked about, you know, we have all the people that we work with on a regular basis around here. Um, I guess in Canada, they probably have the same kind of volunteers. Um, and I don't know if you've had a chance or if anybody else on the call has recommendations um, or thoughts about, um, I guess, museum connections. And, and Matt mentioned the Heritage Rail Alliance earlier. Uh, that's a great place to, to connect with people. Um, any, uh, Nito says Paul Grether. Definitely. Right. Definitely. Kristen. Um, could Matt repost his email address? I didn't get the last half of it. Sure. I'll put, and then I'll send Harry and I's again here. I'll do that right now as we're talking. So if you're going to be typing. And if you don't, if you don't catch it, feel free to reach out to me and I can pass it along as well. And uh, my email is in your, your confirmation and your reminder email that you got tonight for the program for anyone who's looking for my email. Thanks, Matt. Sure. And again, you know, we don't know everything. Please, I love these exchanges. People share things, you know, you will never find Harry and I say we know everything because we don't. We've learned a lot. We've had some great people to work with, you know, I smile. We've had a lot of fun. You know, you, you, hopefully you get some of the camaraderie out of this and the enjoyment, you know, whatever museum you go to and, you know, the others you meet. Um, these can be arduous. This can be very <laughs> dirty and frustrating work. Uh, but, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, really well, that, fun that's work. why it's that's why it's important to have fun, right? Because while you're having all this fun, you're doing all the networking and finding out who has what parts and who can help who with what. And learning. And learning. Well, while I have an open mic, I wasn't sure I was getting through, but it certainly would be. Uh, I'd be remiss without saying thank you so much for the detailed information. It's certainly taken us into a world of technology that uh, certainly in my case, I only wondered about, but uh, to think of all the nuts and bolts and fine details uh, with which you had to deal and uh, some of the, the surprises along the way, uh, your stamina is astounding. And uh, <laughs> I thank you, you guys are amazing. Oh, thank you. Hey, I give Harry a lot of credit. Harry is always like, let's do this with 2168. We said, Okay, let's give it a shot. And it's just been, you know, Harry learned a lot. We, you know, we shared together. Um, so we put a team together. I mean, it, it's fun. The people you meet are fun. You know, I mentioned Matthew Mummert. Um, you know, he's now a shop manager at SEPTA. And we kid around. We both started. We were, I was in college. You know, I think I was like a teenager. We both started as two young guys at Rock Hill Trolley Museum. You know, we both work in the industry, but we still go to Baltimore together. You know, we laugh and have a good time. And, what Harry has learned and what I've learned through Harry, it's, that's the best part, really. Matt, Matt, Harry, uh, I got to go in about 10 seconds because the battery is going to go on my computer. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just want to thank the both of you for a wonderful presentation. And I want to thank <laughs> and wow. Christian for always putting these things together and occasionally putting up with uh, pesky emails from me. So uh, have, a, have a wonderful evening, everyone, and enjoy. Thanks, Thank Edward. You. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Do we have any other comments or questions for Matt and Harry or uh, about their presentation? Yeah, this is Rich. I just have a, a comment to make. It, it amazes me, you know, Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, what they've done, it just amazes me because they don't, you don't have a brick and mortar museum anywhere. But you have cars, you know, at, at two or three different museums that are operating, and you've been able to raise funds and and really um, do a lot uh, for an organization like yours. I mean, hats off to you guys. Great job, really. Thank just you. To sponsor these restorations, and you know, that's fantastic. It just shows how much you can do if you really want to, you know. Yeah, it's uh, it has to be a Philly car in an operating museum. Uh, if it's in your backyard, it's not eligible for a grant. 
and, like and the, other comment I, the, other, the other comment I have is it's really nice to see you bring in teenagers, you know, young folks into helping with the restoration of the vehicles, even with, you know, simple tasks. I mean, that's great. If really we don't, is. if we don't bring these young people in, the museums don't have a future. We, yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, I agree. We need, we need new blood in the, in the hobby. Thanks so much, Rich. I really appreciate it. And that was one of the things you mentioned, the Friends of Philadelphia Trials. We started out, we made a, a conscientious choice that we are not going to start a museum. We, no, we no, saw no. our benefit to being helping Philly cars in museums. We said, you know, there's a, there are a number of Philly cars museums. Rather than tell museums, you should do this, you should do that, or we can do this. It's like, how can we be a help? What can we do to make a difference? And that's to us, you know, it's not, we're not a, sure, Baltimore is geographically closest, and Baltimore National Capital are geographically closest to me, so that's where I go the most. But, you know, it's not, as Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, we try to be open, you know, we try to, you know, accept requests from other museums. A lot we can't fulfill, but what can we do? And the point is to support. We don't want to compete. We're not in that. What can we do to help? Yeah, just, just to give a little background in case you're not familiar, uh, 2003 we incorporated because we wanted to try to raise money. 2168 had been a fan trip fa favorite since the 70s. Everybody chartered it. And uh, SEPTA was getting to the point where they wanted to get rid of all the PCCs that were, st were stored at Elmwood. So we formed a corporation, a nonprofit in 2003 to try to raise money to restore that car. Uh, on SEPTA's property. Well, SEPTA was not interested in that. So by May of 2005, the debris from downtown came. All that junk at Elmwood has to be gone by the end of June. So we were in a panic. And through a, an interesting story, we got in touch with Baltimore Streetcar Museum. And uh, that basically we said, hey, if you'll give this car a home, we'll pay to have it restored, and the rest is history. <laughs> Thanks for Baltimore. Absolutely. I mean, we were an unproven group. Here we came at that time, four founders. We want to do this, and Baltimore said, "We'll give you a shot." And I'm glad. You know, that was had they not done that, I don't, I don't know the group would succeed. It was a great environment. Um, you know, it enabled us through success with that to do other things. Uh, so we paid, we paid two hundred dollars to get it off Septa's property. <laughs> We uh, we have to uh, get this border open so we can have some more uh, charters up here for you. Absolutely, we're hoping. <laughs> we're hoping. Yeah, uh, Patrick, as you know, we uh, we raised some money. It's not a PCC for uh, the eighty forty two at Pennsylvania Trial Museum through a, a TTC charter. I think our, uh, our our newsletter editor said, you know, the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys goes international, but it was right. they, they they were great hosts to us, and we were able to make a grant, several grants to eighty forty two for that. So that was, you know, we found some creative ways to raise money, which was which is great, and our you know every dime of it goes right back into a project. That, that's what we that's why we exist. But we really found with twenty six, the social media component is so important. Right, because that's not, you know, as we said, that's not a Philadelphia project. That is a Baltimore Streetcar Museum and the project team raising all that on our own. And wow, you know, I see Logan's on and again, his social media skills and, um, you know, a diner in Newark. I just think this is great. I want to buy two windows. You know, yeah. as Harry said, a couple NGIT engineers. Hey, we went there. We rode these cars. Um, we even had an interesting comment I won't go into from someone who rode the cars about what you know, some other things, but, uh, you know, it was fascinating. They're like, we got to, it was a group of, if I recall, right, a group of NGIT guys that saw this, they were at a local bar and talked about it and put their money together and bought a couple windows. It's like, hey, you know, but that made, that social media made that challenge successful because, again, it's not, you know, Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys by our charter. It has to be for Philadelphia area car. So without social media, I don't know how the, the car in Baltimore would have taken off. Yeah, we'll be out at uh, we'll be out at PTM in June for a twenty five dollar day, and that's going to benefit car 73, 73, the center entrance car, and we're going to do a video on that car. Logan's going to do a video for that car for for fundraising. Awesome. All right. 
Okay. Well, uh, thank you guys for your presentation. Thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, if, again, if you have an idea for trolleyology and you want to present something uh, related to the trolley era, Pennsylvania, our collection, please let me know. Um, people sending me emails like Matt and Harry wanting to present about a topic. That's how these things happen. So um, thank you very much, you guys. Uh, that was a wonderful program. And uh, Matt, we'll see you again in a couple months or I guess next month. Oh, right. less than a month. <laughs> First thing uh, June. And there were no PCC cars in Hanover, PA, so that's going to be totally different. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, we hope you guys can join us. Uh, everybody here, we hope you join us in a future meeting. Um, you will uh, occasionally get a, an email from the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum called Stay on Track, and that email will have links to register for any upcoming presentations along with some other news about the museum. So um, thank you again, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Good job, guys. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Super. Thanks. Bye, everybody.